whether or not such resolutions and undertakings have been implemented and where implemented, the extent to which they have been implemented and whether such implementation has taken place within a reasonable time and b whether or not legislation or subsidiary legislation passed by the senate has been operationalized and where operational operationalized the extent to which such operationalization operationalization has taken place within a reasonable time you can take your seat Okay, Honorable Senators, at the sitting of the Senate on Wednesday, 15 September 2021, I assured the House that as the chairperson of the Procedure and Rules Committee, I would convene a meeting of the committee to consider, among others, the matter of the proposed, proposed introduction, re reintroduction of the Implementation Committee, which meeting was held on Wednesday, 22nd September 2021. Honorable Senators, the Procedure and Rules Committee is therefore undertaking a review of the standing orders which is customary towards the end of the term of Parliament to address gaps and inadequacies that have been identified in the rules of procedure in the course of the tenor of the House. Consequently, this is a request. Consequently, this is to request any senator that has a proposed uh, has a proposed amendment to the standing orders to file them with the Speaker as set out in Standing Order Number 253. I thank you. Next order. Oh, I see. Next, next order. Order number three, messages. Order number four, petitions. Chair Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to lay the, the following petition reports by the Standing Committee on Education on the table of the Senate today, 23rd September 2021. One, report on petition in the Senate by Mr. Elkana Kitur concerning delayed uh, payments to suppliers of commodities in public secondary schools during the first term of the academy year 2020. And two, report on the consideration of the petition to the Senate by residents and teachers serving in Kachado County on promotion of teachers in the county to leadership positions. Next order. Order number five, papers. Leader. The Speaker, sir, I beg to lay the following papers on the table of the Senate today. 23rd September 2021. One, report of the Auditor General on financial statements of Kalifi, Mariakani Water, and Sewerage Company Limited for the year ended 30th June 2019. Two, report of the Auditor General on financial statements of Kalifi County Microfinance Mbegu Fund for the year ended 30th June 2019. Three, report of the Auditor General on the financial statement of Meru County. Oils Limited for the year ended 30th June 2019. Four, report of the Auditor General on the financial statements of Mombasa County Consolidated, Consolidated Revolving Fund for the year ended 30th June 2019. And five, report of the Auditor General on the financial statement of Mombasa County Alcoholic Drinks Control Fund for the year ended 30th June 2019. Thank you.
The next one is Chia Lands. Or anybody from the committee? Okay, leader. Speaker, sir, I beg to lay the following paper on the table of the Senate today, 23rd September 2021. Report of the Standing Committee on Land, Environment, and Natural Resources on the Natural Resources Benefit Sharing Bill, Senate Bills Number 25 of 2020. I thank you. Next order. Order number six, notice of motion. Senator Chirarge. <coughs> is not in the chamber. Next order. Oh, okay. <coughs> So that one is deferred. Next is the chair health. Leader, you want to? <coughs> health. Chair health. Oh, a member is there, Senator Omanga. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I beg to give notice from uh, the Standing Committee of Health that the Senate adopts the third progress report of the Standing Committee. That the Senate adopts the third progress report of the Standing Committee on Health on the COVID-19 situation in Kenya and preliminary findings on the nation, nation, nationwide COVID-19 vaccine rollout laid on the table of the Senate on Tuesday, 21st October, 2021. <laughs> yes, Senator Wetangula, what's your point of order? <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah, Senator. Uh, speaker, I beg, sorry, I beg to give notice of the following motion that the Senate adopts the third progress report of the Standing Committee on Health on the COVID-19 situation in Kenya and preliminary findings on the nationwide COVID-19 vaccine rollout laid on the table of the Senate on Tuesday, on uh, Thursday, 23rd September, 2021. The, the distinguished senator is a first learner. <laughs> you have to correct the, the date. Okay, sorry, Mr. Speaker, to correct the date, it's on Tuesday, 21st September 2021. Yeah, next order. Order number seven, statements. Senator Milson Omanga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You're a very active senator in this house. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise pass one to the standing order 48-1 to seek a statement from a standing committee of national security, defense, and foreign 
relations regarding the killing of a trader by the police in Kahawa West, Nairobi County, on Wednesday, 25th August, 2021. In the statement, Mr. Speaker, I want the committee to explain the circumstances that led to the death of a trader, Mr. Alex Macharia, on Wednesday, 25th August, 2021, during demonstrations by traders to protest against the demolition of their stalls in Kawa West, Nairobi County. Number two, the committee should provide an update on the investigation on the use of excessive force and live bullets against the demonstrators by police officers during the demonstration. Number three, indicate the measures that have been put in place to ensure that the police officers responsible for the death are brought to book. And uh, finally, outline the steps, if any, that have been taken to compensate the family of Mr. Macharia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Senator Shiro Halaki. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, this being a matter that is very close to my heart in terms of the extrajudicial killing by police, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to contribute to Senator Omanga's uh, statement. And I thank her for, for, not, for not letting the candle go off on this one. This one, the issue around extrajudicial killings and police brutality, at, you know, with, for innocent, with innocent citizens who are, who are just exercising their right to picket and their right to demonstrate peacefully is unacceptable. Mr. Speaker, I come from a county or a group of counties that have suffered the most at the hands of policemen with regards to extrajudicial killings and with regards to disappearances and utter dis in utter disregard for the constitution of Kenya. Mr. Speaker, just the other day, there was a Muse Omar from, our, from my county who was crying that his, his, his son, who is a police officer himself, has disappeared and had, had been picked by police. There's no knowing whether or not he'll come back alive. And therefore, from the coastal region to the northern region and to Nairobi and everywhere in this country, the issues around brutality of, uh, of police, the extrajudicial killings, and just sheer luck of adherence to the rule of law is really disturbing. And I hope that the committee really gets to the bottom of this. It has piled up every Every week or every other day, we are getting uh, issues around extrajudicial killings, issues around police being very trigger happy and, and killing innocent citizens who are just exercising their right to picket is becoming too much. And I, I want to thank Senator Omanga for bringing this up. I know every senator here actually has had a chance to bring this up. It's becoming, and, I, and I'm very happy that the, there's an implementation committee now in place, and I would like to congratulate and thank you for actually actioning that particular request from senators, because especially with regards to security matters, there's so much that's just falling in the cracks, and I hope that this, it, this gets, uh, sees, sees the light of day alongside others that had been brought to this house. I, I support Mr. Speaker. Senator Moses Wetangula. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to support the very active senator from Nairobi <laughs> in her request for the statement in relation to uh, loss of lives arising out of police misconduct. Mr. Speaker, I would want to encourage the distinguished senator that besides making this request, she should use her office also to write to IPOA. I say this, Mr. Speaker, because you, we have noted of late, particularly the Kianjokoma killings in Embu. It is IPOA that took up the matter, investigated very quickly, and as a result, six police officers are in court with a charge of murder. So IPOA will be very helpful besides the statement coming to this, uh, this house. But Mr. Speaker, as I speak on that, I want also to join uh, my colleagues in decrying uh, increasing cases of uh, police uh, use of excessive force against citizens. 
Uh, the rules and the standing uh, uh, orders of the police are very clear that in the case of police suppressing riots or controlling uh, demonstrations and picketers, they are supposed to use rubber bullets if a bullet must be used at all. That's why the police are issued with the, with the truncheons and buttons and then guns and bullets. Guns and bullets are used as a measure of a last resort. When the police themselves are in danger of being attacked by armed criminals, but not picketers and demonstrators, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the other day when the IG appeared before our committee, uh, he said the majority of policemen and women in this country are very good, and I agree with him. But I reminded him that Jesus had 12 disciples, 11 were good, but it's the last one that caused the whole mess of Christianity and betrayed Jesus and caused him to be crucified. And uh, the police must also be having that last one out of 12 that uh, brings a very bad name to an otherwise good force. The new constitution changed the structure of the police from a force to a service. And we want to see that the police are actually giving the people of Kenya a service. In countries uh, like UK, Mr. Speaker, when you are in trouble, you are lost or you are under threat, when you see a policeman is a relief, you run to the police to protect you. In Kenya, unfortunately, when you are in trouble and you see a policeman, your troubles multiply. And uh, this is not uh, supposed to be the case, Mr. Speaker. We want to encourage uh, IG Mutembai and his team he came in on a reformist agenda. When we vetted him, he told us he's going to leave the police force better than he found it. And we want to see that he reforms the police, weeds out the bad elements, and make the police user-friendly to the citizenry of this country. Thank you. Senator Johnson Sakaja. <clears throat> um. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I first want to <clears throat> take this <clears throat> opportunity um, to offer heartfelt uh, condolences to the family of Alex, Masharia, and the people of uh, Kahawa, Kahawa West, um, and the traders who, Mr. Speaker, have lost, they lost a friend, they've lost a family member, They've lost a brother. Mr. Speaker, we brought numerous issues, and I'm really grateful to Senator Umanga, Mama Miradi, for bringing these issues. Mr. Speaker, I'm one of the luckiest senators. I have a very good assistant senator, um, amongst, amongst others, who, who always raises issues of concern to the people of Nairobi in my delegation. What's your point of order, Senator Wetangula? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker is my distinguished nephew, the senator for Nairobi, in order to denigrate the status and standing of the very active senator from Nairobi County, <laughs> Senator Milson Omanga, by describing her as his assistant. <laughs> Every single senator here is here individually as a senator. Whether you are in a delegation or not, you do not become an assistant to the head of delegation. Wow. Mr. Speaker, to the, to the contrary, I have not uh, denigrated uh, Senator Umanga. In fact, I've been praising her. And I've said she's a senator who assists me, and I assist her also in our work. Because Nairobi is big. Nairobi is big. I have 17 constituencies. I have 85 wards, and I have 4 million people. So it is, I'm very lucky that we can assist each other. With all, the, with all the senators in Nairobi delegation, all round, and in many ways. But Mr. Speaker, really back, back to, the, to, to this very important matter. Um, just uh, less than a year ago, I brought the issue of Yasin Moyo, a young man, 13-year-old boy, who was shot at his balcony in Kiamaiko. Mr. Speaker, we went further and followed up that case. It is still dragging in the courts. The police officer is being protected by the prosecution and by the police force, Mr. Speaker. It is very sad that then later, a few months later, another young man, 
was killed again in the same Kiamaiko on a balcony, being shot by live bullets. Mr. Speaker, we brought the case of Steve Nandua, who was killed in Kasarani during protests because of the road. And Mr. Speaker, in as much as I was able to, and I thank the government for assisting us to get more resources to do the road, the road has been done, but that life will never be returned. Mr. Speaker, life is important. And I, I urge the security committee, really. I remember we once did a joint inquiry with the committee on, uh, on justice, on the issue of extrajudicial killings, but there is no action. I, poor, I, I think, I don't know whether we need to amend the law, but they are a toothless dog. There is nothing that they are able to do with respect to these um, actions, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the second issue is the issue of evictions and demolitions. And I'm glad, again, Senator Manga has raised this, because that is why these traders are protesting. These traders are just trying to eke out a living. They have decided not to get into crime. They have decided to find a way to feed their families. They have been evicted. Mr. Speaker, the traders, when we brought the issue of Westlands from that island, I'm sure all of you know where they used to be curious. Three years ago, they were evicted allegedly because of a road. To date, if you drive there, nothing has been done. Those people's livelihoods have been put at risk because of brick and mortar. I just want to urge the NMS and the Nairobi City County to look at Nairobi not just about buildings and brick and mortar and development, but in terms of livelihoods and lives. We have people who, Mr. Speaker, depend on this trade. There have been so many evictions in the past few months all across Nairobi, and I will bring a comprehensive statement detailing each and every one of them. Mr. Speaker, finally, on that same issue, many residents of Nairobi today are sleeping in their homes out of fear. The residents in the old council houses from Woodley, Mr. Speaker, Jericho, um, uh, uh, Ofafa in, in, in Eastlands, Mr. Speaker, Uhuru, because of impending demolitions. Let this entity that we created called NMS work hand in hand with the leaders and with the people, not just to think about what they're going to put up, but to carry the people along. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for that opportunity. And I thank Senator Umanga. Senator Imana Malaki. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me the chance to congratulate uh, our active senator from Nairobi on this particular issue, which is actually a countrywide problem. It's not just for Nairobi, but this cuts across the entire country. It's a sad situation when a Kenyan dies, and especially in the hands of the same force that is supposed to help that particular Kenyan survive. Utumishu Kawote means that uh, the police force must be a service force that uh, helps Wanainchi survive and not kill them. So in this particular case, it's a sad situation. I hope that some compensation is going to be given to the family of the person that's already lost their life, but it should not happen again. You know, uh, Mr. Speaker, every time something happens, something like this happens. It is usually a problem of leadership. Leadership of the police force, poor training of the police force, they should be trained in such a way that they understand that their prime purpose is to protect the citizens of Kenya, is protect Wanainchi, so they are safe wherever they may be. Now, um, I know occasions like in uh, Isiolo, when there were some skirmishes between the Trukana community and the Meru community, it happened there was a young man there that was uh, of the Trukana community that was supposed to act as a policeman and fire bullets into his own people who were usually on the receiving end. And I remember that kid refused to fire those bullets. Guess what? He got murdered by his own force because he did not want to do that. I remember a situation where in Lodwa, the police force, there were some young kids, some um, border border kids who were protesting some bad incidents that were going on. They were being arrested for, having, for not having reflectors. And in that demonstration, one kid was actually gunned down by the police itself. And the, the person who committed that crime was actually protected by the police. Instances like this actually tell you that we do not have Utumish Kawote. We just have a force that has become a rock. And that is usually a failure in leadership. These people are not well trained. They do not know the purpose for which they are serving. They are supposed to serve Wanainchi with respect. And especially in a country that is supposed to be democratic, Kenya 
is supposed to have democratic laws. Kenyans are free to picket. Kenyans are free to demonstrate peacefully for as long as they are not causing harm to other people or breaking property. But then to have a police force that goes in and kills is just not acceptable. So um, as much as uh, Mutiambai said is going to have, is going to leave a force that is more disciplined when he leaves than he found them, I still think that the police force is going down in terms of behavior. There's a lot of harassment of Wanainchi, especially in my part of the world, where mamas have sometimes make busa so they can support their children who are going to school. These people get harassed. Border border kids get harassed. They're supposed to pay 50 shillings for everything that they're accused of. It's very sad that the police becomes a force that is actually victimizing one age. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I hope that the loss of life is going to be compensated handsomely so that those that are left behind can live well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senator Mwenye Haji, thank you. Asante Mwishima Speaker, wakunipa fursahi. Kwanza nige mpongeza Senator Umanga kwa kuleta tarifa hii katika bunge la Senate. Na tumeona kwa mba Senator Umanga ni ni msimamizi ama ni champion wa wale ambao ni wanyonge katika nchi yetu ya Kenya. Mwishima Speaker, swala la polisi na kutuajibika kwa polisi ni swala ambalo limezungumziwa kwa muda mrefa hapa katika bunge la Senate. Wiki liokwisha tu tulizungumzia swala la kupotezwa kwa Professor Abdi Salam na mfanyibiashara Abdul Hakim uh, Sagar kule Mombasa. Na maajabu ni kwa watu wawa wili waliachiliwa wali huru usiku uh, wa jumapili na jumamosi mtawalia. Mwishima speaker waliachiliwa katika maeneo ambayo ni mbali na, na nyumba zao na ni mbali kwa, na ni, ni hatari kwa usalama wao. Kwa mfano Mwishima speaker Mwishima speaker ndugu yetu Charles Gay Mheshimiwa hafai ku, 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 kuzungumza na seneta mwingine wakati amempa speaker mgongo Charles Gay these nomadic tendencies are very disturbing and <laughs> thank you what's your point of order and it's very happy then the nomads are very important people in this country. We should not be degraded, Mr. Speaker, sir. Did not, I did not mean to degrade them. I just said nomads are people who move from one place. Yes, to and, and we are of, happy with that. In search of pastures. Tell him as a farmer he should not walk around farming. And <laughs> <laughs> Senator Faki. Kwa Mr. Speaker, ni kuwa utenda wakazi wa polisi umekuwa ukimwiliki kwa mara kwa mara na bungeli la seneti. Na mpaka hatua muhimu zitakapochukuliwa dhidi ya polisi, Mheshimiwa Speaker hakuna jambo lolote ambalo litaweza kufanyika kwa sababu kila wiki visa vya vya kutowajibika kwa polisi vinaongezeka. Uh, mwezi uliokwisha ilikuwa ni Mombasa, juzi kawa Nairobi, tena Nairobi. Eh, <coughs> mwezi ule mwingine ilikuwa kule Laikipia. Kwa hivyo visa bado vinaendelea ku, 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 kutokea Kwa hivyo mwishima speaker ningeomba, swala hili li, lijadiliwe sio na kamati ya usalama peke yake lakini hata kamati ya haki na uh, ya, ya sheria na haki za, 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 za binadamu. Kwa sababu, yale anayotendeka sio kinyume cha usalama peke yake lakini kinyume cha katiba yetu. Kwa hivyo kamati usika inausiana na haki za binadamu, sheria, inafaa ichunguze swala hili. Mheshimiwa Speaker hapo awali nilipokuwa katika kamati hii tulikuwa tumezunguka katika sehemu tofauti tofauti kuweza kuchunguza masuala ya kuuliwa kiolela kwa kwa raia wa nchi ya Kenya. Na mpaka leo Mheshimiwa Speaker ripoti hiyo bado haijaweza kuletwa katika bunge. Kwa hiyo ningeomba Mheshimiwa uiarifu ama waamrishe wa kamati hii ya, ya Justice and Legal Affairs Committee walete hiyo ripoti katika bunge ili tuweze kuijadili na kutoa muongozo vipi polisi ya mashiria itaweza kutekelezo. Asante mwishima speaker. Senator Wambua Enokio. 
I think we should disconnect. Why did the, the speaker leave this today? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I've heard Senator Wade say something about me, but I will not repeat it here. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I also want to take this opportunity to, to thank uh, Senator Millicent Omanga, who has declared herself the most active senator in the chamber. And yes, she is very active, and for good reason. Uh, Madam Speaker, I want to say just two things. One, that Madam Speaker, Article 37 of the Constitution of Kenya 2010 guarantees every person anywhere in this country a right to assemble, to demonstrate, to picket, and to present petitions to public authorities. Madam Speaker, picketing is not a crime and it cannot be that the price you pay for picketing is to lose your life. The act that establishes the Kenya Police Service gives officers a duty of care and a responsibility to enforce the law and the constitution. So, Madam Speaker, to the extent that a police officer would pull the trigger and cause the death of a human being on account of picketing, Madam Speaker, that is a serious violation of the Constitution of Kenya, a violation of basic rights, the right to picket. Uh, secondly, Madam Speaker, I want to join my senior uh, leader, um, Senator Wetangula, to say that when the Inspector General of Police uh, took office, he promised far-reaching changes, positive changes, in the operations of police officers, in ensuring uh, law and order across the country. Madam Speaker, I want uh, to ask the IG from the floor of this Senate uh, to look at that oath that he took, the oath of office, the promises that he gave to the people of this country, and look back at the record of the operations of the police officers since he took office. And we'll be surprised to learn that we are slowly but surely sliding back to the dark days of police brutality. Madam Speaker, from the floor of this house, we must condemn that act, and we must hold officers responsible uh, to account uh, for that loss and the other losses, but at the end of the day, the buck stops with the IG, who is the head of the police service. Madam Speaker, with those remarks, I support the statement. Honorable Senators, I know we, all, we are all aware that we are decided at some stage that we will limit comments on statements, and I see interest, so I'm going to give only two, and then we'll come to the end of the statement. Senator Langat Christophe Andrew. He can donate if, if okay, he wants thank his you. two minutes. He can donate to you. Thank you, Madam Senator Speaker. Gerarke. Yeah, I'll consider. Okay, thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to start with condoling with the families or the family of this particular man who was killed by the police from Kahawa West. It is very sad that... Uh, the police, whom we are expecting to assist us to save lives, ironically, they have turned to become the risk in the society. So I want to say, Madam Speaker, that we've been speaking here almost every week on several statements concerning the police brutality in our country. I think it is high time that we get into another very serious position as the Senate so that we may save the lives of Kenyans who are innocent and they are being killed by this particular police. And I want to plead to you, uh, Madam Speaker, that the committee that will take over this particular matter take it seriously and, if possible, we call the uh, Inspector General 
Mr. Mutiambai, to appear before the Committee of the Whole so that most of the questions that we have in our minds and in our hearts may be answered by him, or otherwise, if he cannot, we should call upon him to resign. I think he has been defeated, and we are actually ashamed that when he was appointed, we had really showered him here with a lot of praises. We had a lot of expectation from him, but I want to say it's very unfortunate. Killings in this particular country is rising every now and then. So I want to say that uh, it is quite sad, and I want even to call upon him. If possible, he should resign and give another person who is capable of controlling all these issues uh, to take over and bring peace to this particular country. If it, if it is getting at this particular high rate at this time, what about next year when uh, during the time for campaigns and elections? It will be worse. So I want to... As a Senator uh, Pogisio, leader of majority. Madam Speaker, I just want to begin by paying also condolences to the family of the man, uh, Mr. Karanja, the late Karanja, and his friends and the business partners, whatever what happened in that situation is not to be condoned, it's to be condemned. And Speaker, I think any life is precious, uh, human life. And I think that's our job in the Constitution provides the rights of all people, all Kenyans. And so um, I want to commend uh, Senator Omanga for bringing this situation, bringing this case to us, and that this will go to the committee, the right committee, and I think that the members of that committee will do a good job, like they have done. And I just want to say that um, we take this very seriously. I uh, agree that we need the implementation committee so that such things can be followed to their conclusion. I want to thank you. S uh, Senator Malala, Senator Fukakamega. Asante sana bi speaker. Kwanza ngependa kutuma Risala za Rambi Rambi kwa familia ya Marehemu Masharia kwa kumpoteza mmoja wao. Jambo la pili ningependa pia kumshukuru seneta mteule wa kaunti ya Nairobi kwa kuleta swala hili katika bunge. Na swala hili bi speaker si swala tu ambalo ni la Nairobi peke yake ama ni swala ambalo limefanyika tu katika uh, kitendo hiki bi speaker swala hili ni swala la kitaifa tuko na askari ambao wametumia nyadhfa zao za kuwa maaskari na kuwa katika kitengo ambacho kinaweza dhulumu watu kuhakisha kwamba wamedhulumu wananchi bi speaker ni muhimu sana tuanze kuangalia ile mfumo ya masomo ya askari wanapoenda katika chuo chao cha kule kiganjo baada wamekuwa wamechukuliwa kama maaskari mfumo huo paka uangaliwe kindani ni lazima tuangalie ni vipengele gani wanafunzo wakiwa kule tuko na vipengele kama saikolojia askari wetu wako na shida za saikolojia ni lazima tuweze kuhakikisha kwamba masomo ya kisaikolojia imekita mizizi katika chuo cha kufunza maaskari wakati wanaenda kule. Jambo la pili ni lazima tuangalie pia wanakaa aje katika kambi zao. Askari wengi wako na ile kitu ambayo inaitwa mental health problems bwana um, be speaker. Nimeona wameshaniashia taa ya ishara kuonyesha kwamba inafaa ni kuwe natimiza maongezi yangu katika kutamatisha maongezi yangu lakini ningependa kuomba tu dakika tu moja kidogo nimalizie kusema kwamba ni lazima tuangalie ni nini hii inasumbua askari wetu na tuangalie ni jinsi gani tunaweza tatua 
swala hili la kuhakikisha kwamba maaskari awadhulumu wananchi wa nchi yetu hii. Otherwise bwana be speaker ningependa kusema kwamba uh, tuzidi kuhakikisha kwamba tumeweka hao askari kwa sababu ukiangalia hata wakati ule wa uh, wa maandamano uh, baada ya kura kuna watu wengi waliaga dunia kuna watu wengi walidhulumiwa wafuasi wetu wa NASA ile coalition iliyokuwa inaitwa NASA waliaga dunia lakini hakuna jambo ambalo limefanyika tungependa pia ile department ya DPP iangalie kwamba wale askari na pia police oversight authority wale askari ambao wanakosa nidhamu katika utendakazi wao waeze chukuliwa atua iwezekana Eh uh, Senator Sherarge Samson Kip Rotich Nandi County Thank you uh, Madam Speaker I think mine is just uh, to condemn and expect the committee of national security Madam Speaker you are aware the CS of Interior was supposed to appear on the issue of uh, Laikipia as we talk one person has been killed and 30 livestock have been stolen in uh, Olmorana as we talk So this thing is continuing to happening and Madam Speaker when I was then then chair of JLAC we were working on report on extrajudicial killing and enforced disappearances I don't know whether that report has been tabled and if there's in table what are the recommendations that the committee would propose so that we don't see such occurrences going into the future because what is happening on on Moran today and other parts of the country the Kianjongoma brothers and many others is becoming a challenge in this republic so I hope this statement by Senator Omanga will include others and uh, the committee can take on its own motion madam speaker in conclusion to try and come up with measures that can deter the rock police because i believe there are police that are good but others who are rock they should be rooted out of the service i thank you madam speaker and uh, finally senator murko menonesmas kipchumba elgeo marakwet be, uh, be speaker nashukuru kwa nafasi ambayo umenipatia kwanza na, naanza kwa rizala za rambirambi kwa jamaa na marafiki na familia ya bwana Alex Masharia ambaye kwa lugha ya kisasa bwana B speaker tunasema kwamba ni e, mwanabiashara ambaye anaweza kusemwa alikuwa ni hasla na B speaker imekuwa ni jambo la kusikitisha sana kuona kwamba polisi wetu miaka kumi baada ya kupitisha katiba mpya bado wanatumia nguvu kuumiza wananchi wa kawaida tunajua kwamba katiba yetu inalinda haki ya mwananchi kutetea haki yake kwa njia ya maandamano kama vile wanabiashara wao waliokuwa wali, wali na bwana Alex Masharia walivyofanya kuhakikisha ya kwamba wanatetea haki yao kwa sababu bispika kubomoa biashara za watu na manyumba ni njia ambayo tunasema ni njia duni ya uh, nchi kama yetu ya kidemokrasia inaweza kutumia askari wake kuumiza wananchi wake na bi speaker mimi nasema ya kwamba uh, ingewezekana sana tungepata ile kamati yenye inaongozwa na rafiki yangu uh, kwa hivi sasa kwa bahati mzuri sana uh, bwana Uta ndio mwenyekiti kwa wakati huu bi speaker angeweza kuchukua hatua kali sana kuhakikisha ya kwamba uh, mkuu wa polisi anawajibika na ule waziri wa interior anawajibika ili sisi tusikuje tu hapa kusoma hii uh, habari kwa, kwa bunge kuonekana na wananchi na hakuna haki yenye imetendeka tunataka tuone ya kwamba polisi wetu wanawajibika kwa njia ambayo wanafanya kazi yao na wanalinda maisha ya mwananchi wa kawaida bi speaker na shukuru mheshimiwa Omanga kwa kuchukua nafasi hiyo kutetea bwana Masharia na familia yake na wale wote ambao wamegandamizwa kwa kutumia nguvu kwa polisi kutumia nguvu asante bi speaker thank you senators i think that brings us to the uh, comments on that uh, statement and uh, the next statement and i think it stands committed to the committee the relevant committee we uh, statement by senator johnson sakaja Um <clears throat> thank you thank you once again uh, madam speaker but as speaker I rise pursuant to standing order 
48.1 to seek a statement from the chairperson of the Standing Committee on Health on the status of Mbagathi Hospital in Nairobi City County. Madam Speaker, there have been numerous complaints on the quality of services being offered at this facility and concerns about some of its structures that need urgent rehabilitation and innovation. Um, currently, Madam Speaker, because of the centralized procurement, there is shortage of drugs. As we speak today, and I'm sure today, there is no nitrous oxide that is used in the theater and basic supplies. Madam Speaker, this facility serves thousands of residents of Nairobi, especially those from informal settlements and low-income areas, but has been neglected and not given priority as required, despite the huge budgetary um, allocations on health. The NMS should be held accountable as a health function is their responsibility. So, Madam Speaker, I would like to request the chairperson in his detailed response, detailed, to address the following specific issues that require urgent attention. Number one, the chairperson should give an explanation as to why there's a shortage of nurses and critical care specialists, specialists and what action is being taken. As we speak, there is only one special critical care specialist and there's a shortage of nurses. Number two, explain why the two ICU machines and equipment have been gathering dust at the stores at Magathi for months and have not been installed, yet that is a critical service that the residents of Nairobi deserve to be getting. Number three, what the NMS is doing to ensure that there is a consistent supply of pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical supplies at the hospital. And as I've mentioned, basic drugs are, are, are not available and supplies like the nitrous um, oxide. Finally, Madam Speaker, um, to give a time frame as to when uh, the tent that is being used for isolation and treatment of COVID-19 will be sorted out. Madam Speaker, if you go there today yourself, you'll see the status is deplorable, starting from the floor to everything around it. Madam Speaker, I brought this statement because um, in addition to the issues, Are today... You, do, you, do you want to debate your No, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, giving you, I'm giving you context. I'm and giving the context. the statement, you just read it and others will make comments. No, no, I'm not talking about... Why don't you You're listen? not talking on the same? No. Okay. But as Speaker, the health committee members will tell you that today the NMS came to the health committee and were giving answers to a similar question from Senator um, Kwamboka, who's also one of the assistant, I mean, the senators we assist each other with in Nairobi. <laughs> but the answers were all, the, the answers were vague and one-liners. And that is why I've now brought this to, in detail. So they don't let them go away without giving detailed responses, Madam Speaker. That is the only context I'm giving. I thank you for this opportunity. I'll allow a very few, maybe... What's your point of order, Senator Ali? Point of information. Madam Speaker, I want to inform the Honorable Senator... Informing, I'm, and it's already through... And yes, but it's concerning the same issue, because I'm a member of the committee. Okay. We, dis we disagreed with what they brought, and we have told them that they should come up in the next two weeks with a, comp a co proper answer and very well informed and very detailed. So I'm sure his statement will on help with that. Subject? On the same subject on Bagadi. Yes, so we had a meeting with NMS this morning, but today. Okay. But uh, they didn't come with proper answers. So that, uh, uh, but we have told them we, want, we don't want one-line answers. We want proper comprehensive answers concerning the ICU, concerning the issue of oxygen, uh, concerning the the whole hospital and what happens in that hospital. Thank you. Yeah, so you have been reached that Yeah, statement. in the next two, two okay. weeks, we'll have an answer. Fine. I will allow a few comments because we have, as, uh, we have, some, uh, we have a lot of uh, work before us, uh, Senators. Senator Murkomen on Esmas Kipchumbak. Elge Marakwet. Bispeaker, ile swali imeletwa na Bwana Sakaja, ambaye ni Seneta wa Nairobi ni swali ya maana sana. Kwanza kabisa hali ya afya kwa kaunti zetu sio tu Nairobi county lakini kaunti zote taifa hii iko na shida kubwa sana. Sijui Kisumu county penye unatoka bispika lakini Elgeo Marakwet penye ninatoka. Ile kazi ilifanywa na county governments ama kaunti zetu ama serikali zetu za majimbo kwa mwaka mula ya kwanza ya ugatuzi ilikuwa ni bora kuliko ile kazi wamefanya 
kwa ile mula wa pili aswa magavana wale wanafanya kazi kwa uh, uh, wanamaliza tam yao ya pili nilikuwa elgeo mara kwa weekend uh, madam speaker na ile referral hospital ya iten iko kwa hali atari sana atari sana wagonjwa wengi wanalala chini wanakusanywa wanakusanywa pamoja wale wako na covid na wale hawana covid hali ni hivyo hivyo huko uh, kitui uh, bispika tuliona juzi na ndugu zetu uh, um, uh, uh, wambua alituonyesha na sisi tuliona kupitia hata runinga na habari ya kwamba mahospitali ya kitui hata mbuzi wanakaa huko ndani bispika mahospitali ya kitui uh, uh, bispika unapata ya kwamba wagonjwa wamerundikana kwa kwa nyumba moja na nilishangaa juzi gavana wa Kitui amenunua malori ya kupeleka mbuzi lakini hana magari ya kupeleka eh, bispika wagonjwa ma ambulance ya kupeleka wagonjwa hospitali unajua ni kwa nini bispika kaunti nyingi hawaweki pesa nyingi kwa mambo ya afya na hospitali ni kwa sababu zile dawa zinanululiwa kwa hospitali aileti ile makandarasi ya kuleta pesa ya kuibwa na magavana na wale wanafanya kazi kwa kaunti kwa sababu kazi ya afya haina njia ya kuiba kupitia kujenga wengi wao wanaiba pesa ile ya kununua dawa kutoka directly kutoka kaunti ya, ya, ya kaunti na bwana sakaja ameleta swali nzuri sana lakini nataka nikumbushe ndugu yangu seneta sakaja ya kwamba siku ile nilikuwa hapa kwa meza hii nikisema kwamba serikali ya kaunti haiwezekani kuendeshwa na mwanajeshi nikisema kwamba accountability ama uwajibikaji kwa serikali ambayo sio serikali ya mwananchi serikali ya ugatuzi ambayo haina accountability serikali ya ugatuzi ambayo kaunti yenyewe inanunua vitu na hakuna procurement sasa nani atajibu bwana Sakaja? Atajibiwa na nani? Atuwezi leta mwanajeshi akuja akae hapa katika uh, chumba hiki? Swali lingine najiuliza, kama mtu ni gavana wa Nairobi, yeye ana handle mambo ya procurement, mambo ya kuhakikisha hospitali zinaendelea. Anawezaje kuletwa hapa? Uh, Senator Sherarge, what is your point of order? And uh, under which standing uh, order? Eh, ningependa senator mwalimu wangu senate uh, standing order please under what standing order M point of order madam speaker kwa Kiswahili hoja ya nidhamu ningependa kuuliza mheshimiwa senator wa Elgeyo Marakwet mwalimu wangu senator Murkomen akisema jeshi ni jeshi aina gani kwa sababu Kenya hii tuko na jeshi la wakofu tuko na jeshi la mahasla tuko na jeshi la ingekuwa vyema afafanue kwa sababu wa Kenya wasiweze kuchanganyikiwa ku, ku hilo ndio hoja ningeuliza mheshimiwa speaker senator mulko men be clear be clear yes. eh, asante be speak, speaker be speaker unajua ya kwamba Nairobi inasimamiwa na major generali wa jeshi la taifa la Kenya sio yule amestaafu yule ambayo tayari saa hizi tukiongea ni major general na siku ile tulisambiwa ya kwamba Nairobi county imewekwa kuongozwa na major general swali nilileta hii bunge nikauliza inawezekanaje tulete majeshi yetu ambao wanaheshimika dunia mzima waingie katika nyanja sa siasa ya kufanya mambo ya executive ya kusimamia mambo ya um, uh, procurement bispika na hivi sasa ni hata swali ile uh, senator Sakaja najiuliza tu swali itawezekana senator Mbito kuita major general akuja ulize maswali katika katika katika, katika hii chambers misbika kwa sababu kwa muda wote tangu Nairobi ikuwe na NMS hakuna siku hakuna siku major general ameitwa na kamiti yoyote ya hii seneti na akaweza kuja hapa Senators, um, Senator Alake, I gave you time. You didn't even uh, get me. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I, 
uh, my point of order is, is one of relevance. How is it that the fact that somebody is, is in the army relevant to execution? If there's one execution that is perfected around the world in procurement, is actually military procurement. So we cannot say that we cannot say that the military is, it's not relevant. Uh, Senator Sakaja, what's your point of order? Niko na hoja la nidhamu. Kwa sababu, ingawaje na kubaliana na mambo mengine amba, enye Senator Murko mena nasema, staki ya mpotoshe, huyu meja generali ya fikiri ya tiafai kuja kwa Senate. Lazima wajibike na katiba inasema wazi ya kwamba tunezaita kila mtu. Leo nafikiri e, alijuasilisha kwa kamati ya afya na lazima ajua ya kwamba atajibu maswali. Tulimpa nafasi wafanye kazi, tukampa nafasi waanze lakini vile mambo inaenda lazima lazima akuje awajibike kwa senate na watu wa Nairobi wana maswali mengi. So Senator Murkomen usi, 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 usifanye usimpotoshe afikirie kwa sababu Murkomen amesema jeshi haezi kuja aache kuja hapa lazima aje na apeane majibu kwa watu wa Nairobi. Lakini hiyo hiyo changamoto ambayo imepatikana na nakubaliana ndio maana sasa mwaka ujao nitakuwa gavana na mimi si mwana jeshi. Mimi kama raia wa kawaida tutaendelesha vitu vizuri. Uh, Senator Murkomen please the speaker, uh, wind the speaker up. ni nakubaliana aswa kabisa na Senator Sakaja kwamba kisheria kisheria hakuna mtu hakuna mtu awezi akaitwa seneti hii awajibike hiyo ni kisheria na hiyo ni haki na lazima huyo eh, major general afike kamati za bunge ajibu maswali lakini bi speaker tumekuwa hapa jana tukipitisha hoja tukisema kwamba ma, 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 eh, mawaziri wamekataa kuja katika makamati za seneti wamekataa kuja seneti bi speaker kama mawaziri wa, wakuji katika na wao ni civilians na sasa huyu major general bi speaker hiyo ndio changamoto nilikuwa nasema ya kwamba i fai i fai kamwe kabisa makosa kama hii imefanyika katika Nairobi county ifanyike tena ya kwamba watu ambao they are still i wish he was a retired general ingefaa bi speaker now you, you now you are spoiling namaliza namaliza nasema kama angekuwa mtu ambaye amestaafu generali ambaye amestaafu ingekuwa rahisi sana afanye kazi yale ambayo tunasema ni kazi ya mwananchi wa kawaida kawaida lakini lazima tuheshimu wanajeshi wetu tuwaondoe katika siasa kama hizi za Nairobi na kama miaka zijazo tusijipate katika shida kama hii yenye Mbagadi Hospital iko nayo na kwa hivyo nataka nisisitize kamati yetu ya afya Najua eh, naibu mwenye kiti yuko hapa. Oh ya yeah, yeah, senator senator wawajia ni mwenye ah, Kumbe alisushwa daraja. Yeye sasa ni ni mwana kamati tu. Katika enzi zangu alikuwa mtu mkubwa. Katika uongozi wangu alikuwa mtu mkubwa. Kwa hivyo uh, bi speaker ningependa kusema ya kwamba tunaomba kamati ya afya ihakikishe ya kwamba kaunti zetu siwajibike kwa mambo ya afya ili tuweze tukapeleka uh, taifa letu mbele asante bi speaker i've not given you an opportunity you are already on your on your on your on your feet just sit then i'll give you the opportunity because i'm seeing the button here for intervention <laughs> senator I was looking at you and you are busy talking to your neighbor. Yes. Uh, Senator uh, uh, Abdullahi. Yeah. Honorable member for uh, Elgoy Market in order to claim that I have been demoted when I have been promoted to be the chairman of trade and tourism. And I have decided to remain there as a member. And in any case, I want to tell the honorable uh, member that the DG for Nairobi, Brigadier uh, Literal General Mohamed Badi has been coming to this committee and he will come and come to the committee whenever we ask him to come. Thank you, Madam Speaker. S come and be informed accordingly. Now, uh, members, there's a lot of interest. Th th that was information. What's your point of order? Mr. Speaker, um, 
uh, is it in order for Senator uh, of uh, Wajia to try to mislead the House when I was very clear that in my days he was the vice chair of the Health Committee and that, and, 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 and him moving from vice chair to an ordinary member is a demotion within that committee, within that committee. And now, I think you are now getting out of order. Your point has been noted. You've been promoted. You have another committee. And the Senator Murkomen, please let's have some order in the House. Now, I'm giving only two more members to make very few comments. I think you give only two minutes. Senator Olekina. Madam Speaker, I thank you. Madam Speaker, I rise to support this statement, which is quite timely. May it be noted that uh, NMS has actually been violating the KEMSA Act because for the last 16 months, they have not purchased their medicine or pharmaceutical products from KEMSA. Madam Speaker, this House passed a legislation directing every single county government to purchase their pharmaceuticals from KEMSA. There was a directive given by the President, and I don't know whether a directive given by the President supersedes an Act of Parliament. And I think it will be noted that this is a violation of the law because for the last 16 months, KEMSA has indicated that NMS has never purchased anything. The other big issue, the reason why I know that there is a big shortage of uh, pharmaceuticals in Nairobi hospitals and also all around is that we are told that Nairobi County owes 382 million shillings to uh, KEMSA. So, Madam Speaker, I think this is a time when this House must now start really becoming bold in ensuring that if we pass legislation, they are implemented. Because there's no reason as to why there should be a directive from the President, yet the Act of Parliament supersedes the Presidential Directive. This is the reason why there are shortages of nurses, because people are not being paid well. The reason why I've always stood my ground on this, on this fact, and I'll continue doing the same thing, that NMS is an illegal entity. It has got no you know, business you know, working in this government. Because right now, Madam Speaker, the situation in Nairobi is not really legal. Because I can assure you, there are so many hospitals that have been built, and that money has not gone through the shareable revenue. I mean, that is illegal. And let me tell you what will happen in this country. In, after 2022, when the ground has been fully leveled, there are some people who will rot in jail because Article 226, Subsection 5 will go after them. And I hope that whoever the leadership will be in after 2022 will uphold the rule of law so that we can bring all this nonsense to an end. There is no point as to why we should be crying that our people are not getting medicine, yet we are here. In fact, any governor, in his right sense of mind, the first priority should be hospitals. Madam Speaker, I'm in the health committee. And the kind of thing that we see and we hear, it's something which is, you know, devastating for this country. So, Madam Speaker, I hope that uh, whenever I push for an item to be brought for a full house, I, I know what I'm talking about. This is one of those things where, I hope I'm still live. Madam Speaker, just one more minute, please. I know you had given us two minutes. Just one more minute because I'm a member of the health committee. I need to give you some good information. Senator Lekina, you'll use that uh, opportunity seconds. during the committee time. Because 30 seconds. you are the ones who are going to make... Uh, 30 seconds, Madam Speaker. 30 seconds. And I'll count it down. Please Madam Speaker, oh, yeah, please let me summarize up. it this wind way. Up, yeah. I don't know, and, I, and I, I, I thank Senator Sakaja for bringing this statement. But the truth of the matter is this. NMS should not even be appearing before the Senate because it is the county government of, Ni of Nairobi we should be appearing before the Senate. What business do we have dealing with a person who is supposed to be submitting his status report on the task that has been, or the function that has been transferred to him, to, to the executive? coming to answer to the Senate. This is why we need to differentiate who should come before the Senate. The same way we have said we are not entertaining principal secretaries, we want the, we want the cabinet secretary, is the same position we, be, we should be taking. So in this one, the right person for us to ask this is the, the, the executive. If there is an executive 
in Nairobi County. The problem, Madam Speaker, is that we put ourselves in this hole and, yes, I'd like to be informed. Kindly, uh, just, like wind, or just wind, you will, will inform, but just in wind up, please. I will inform him if he goes. I need to inform him to respond to that. Madam Speaker, I'm glad uh, Senator Ledama has brought out a very interesting aspect. Article 187 of the Constitution that talks about transfer of functions states that the constitutional responsibility for a function that is transferred remains with the entity or the level of government that has transferred it. And indeed what that means, what that means is even in this inquiry, it is the Nairobi City County government that should appear and they can come with the NMS as an implementing agent, but not the NMS on their own. So I hope the health committee takes note of that, that you invite the Nairobi County government and NMS, but the person who takes constitutional responsibility remains the Nairobi City County government as it exists. Now, unfortunately, I don't know if you have a governor who is acting, who is... So they come because they bear the... The county government is, a, is, is an entity. It, it exists in perpetuity. But they come together with the implementing... In the same way, if you asked a question on water, you'd ask the Nairobi County government and they can come with Nairobi water, for instance. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you for that, Thank Madam you. Speaker. Yes, Senator Wynda, Madam Speaker, yeah. to conclude, um, <laughs> I'm even forgetting what I wanted to say. But... Uh, I, I, no, 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 I'm not going to sit down. But I think what Senator Sakaja said is one of the things that we, all of us in this house, should actually be pushing for. Because what is happening, Madam Speaker, and this is something which will hound us forever. The day we killed that report on NMS here, on, on uh, MES, because the first question which is being asked here is why do we have equipment which we have paid for and they are lying collecting dust, yet people are getting sick every day. The ICU beds are very, many, they're very few in this country. So, Madam Speaker, this is a matter which I want to request. That from your desk, from your seat there, you can be able to give us proper guidance. And I'm happy that I heard when I was coming in that now, we're now looking under the implementation committee. Because each committee has been self-implementing, but this is a matter that we now need to follow up. Because even though... We killed the report on NMS. Senator, on, on we've, been, you, we've been very lenient with you, kindly. Just wind up. All right. Finally, Mr. Madam Speaker, I thank you. <laughs> and finally, Senator Ombo. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I am hoping and praying that I will get the same uh, leniency as, uh, as Senator Ledama. But, um, Madam Speaker, to just point out, and Sakaja, I wanted you to listen to this because it's important. You know, this is not just about, about health. But on speaker, this, this must be about all the functions that have been transferred from the county government of Nairobi to the NMS. And I say this, Madam Speaker, because today senators will contribute to this uh, statement on account of how they are aligned either with NMS or with the county government of Nairobi. But on speaker, when finally the chips are down, somebody will be held accountable on both the process and the outcome. I say this because of the article that um, uh, Senator Zakaja has made reference to, was it Senator Ledama, 187.2b that if a function or power is transferred from a government at one level to a government at the other level, constitutional responsibility for the performance of the function or exercise of the power shall remain with the government to which it is assigned by the fourth schedule. The fourth schedule assigns health to the county government of the Nairobi City uh, County. And the fourth schedule does not know any institution or any person called NMS. So even as committees entertain contributions and submissions from NMS, they must be guided by that uh, article. Secondly, Madam Speaker, and I will ask for 30 seconds, on the matter of the health status in Gitwe County, I brought a statement two weeks ago here to the Committee on Health, and I demonstrated how goats and sheep and donkeys 
are taking refuge in facilities that are supposed to be uh, health centers and dispensaries. The health committee committed uh, to visit the county and bring to this house a report on status of health in Kitui County. Madam Speaker, the people of Kitui County are still waiting for that report, for that visit. They don't care who the chairman of the committee is, who the vice chair is, who has been demoted or promoted. They want health and they want a report from this Senate. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senators. I think that brings us to the end of that statement and I stand committed to the relevant committee. Senator Majority Leader. Senator Pugishu. Not on this. But yeah, on your next statement, yeah. Thank you, Madam, Madam Speaker, thank you. Um, I think, Madam Speaker, some, some, some of the things to take note of before I read this one. Uh, and I, I see Senator Murkomen has left. But I think we should be able to control how much uh, someone can bang our furniture and uh, almost breaking them. Um, but uh, secondly, Madam Speaker, I think some of the members uh, uh, who are speaking to this matter are members of the Committee of Health. And they have all opportunity to go and deal with this matter. They are speaking to themselves. <laughs> and the thing is going to be referred to them. So take note. That's simple, and then they go and deal with it. Uh, short report, a statement by Senate Majority Leader on the business of the week. Madam Speaker, pass one to standing order 52-1. I hereby present to the Senate the business of the Senate for the week commencing Tuesday, 28 September 2021. On Tuesday, uh, Madam Speaker, on Tuesday, 28th September 2021, the Senate Business Committee will meet to consider the approve and approve the business for the week. Subject to the approval by the committee, the Senate will consider bills at the second reading stage, bills at the committee of the whole stage, and motions on reports filed by select committees. On Wednesday, 29th, and on Thursday, 30th September 2021, the Senate will consider business that will not be concluded on Tuesday 28th and Wednesday 29th, September 2021, respectively. And any other business scheduled by the Senate commit, business committee, including petitions and statements. Madam Speaker, there are nine bills due for committee of the whole stage, three of which have been captured in today's order paper at orders number 17, 18, and 19. There are 22 bills due for second reading, of which a number have been captured in today's order paper from order number nine. Additionally, motions filed by the committee chairpersons and uh, individual senators have also been listed in the order paper. These bills, Madam Speaker, and motions have been allocated slots on weekly program of Senate business. However, for one reason or another, the Senate is unable to proceed as, as scheduled in the weekly program. I therefore urge respective movers to be available in the Senate whenever their business is listed on the order paper to ensure that the business is transacted before the close of the fifth session in December 2021. Standing committees are encouraged to hasten consideration of bills referred to them and to table reports thereon. Committee chairpersons and individual senators proposing amendments are I to be available in the chamber to move the same at the committee of the whole. I wish to applaud, uh, applaud committees for their efforts in processing filed statements and petitions referred to them. However, there is still a high number of petitions, totaling 48, still pending conclusion in the Senate. I urge respective standing committees to expedite consideration of the petitions and any other pending business and table reports pursuant to the standing orders. Madam Speaker, in conclusion, the Senate leadership in cons consultation with the proposed recon uh, reconstitution of select committees is consulting on the proposed reconstitution of select committees. This is obviously a matter of interest to every senator, and I assure the House that the changes proposed are geared towards enhancing efficiency and effectiveness in the committees. I request for patience as the leadership of the House finalizes on this matter. Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, I thank you, and hereby lay the statement on the table of the Senate. Thank you. Uh, senator Kajuang, what's the point of order? 
Madam Speaker, I, I rise pursuant to Standing Order 191 that talks about composition of select committees, which goes further to say that a select committee shall consist of an odd number of senators more than nine. And Madam Speaker, the leader of majority has requested for patience as the leadership consults on the constitution of committees, but the devolution committee is not functional as a result of that uh, standing order. The devolution committee lost Senator Kabaka, lost Senator Prengei, and Senator Mwaura. And so we are unable to hold meetings. And Madam Speaker, devolution committee could be among the most important committees in this house. Could I request the leadership that if the matters of allocating members to other committees is taking time and requires consultation, let them bring a motion next Tuesday specific to the devolution committee so that we are able to handle the statements, we are able to handle the bills. We are currently handling bills relating to transfer of functions, which was the uh, point of discussion in the statement brought by uh, Senator Sakaja. Madam Speaker, I want to urge the leadership to prioritize the devolution committee so that the other issues uh, of, of, of uh, moving people from one committee to the other can take as much time as the House wishes. Thank you, Senator. Senator Anderitu, John, you have an intervention? Okay. I can uh, see you have, an, you have an intervention. Yes. Um, Madam Speaker, I agree because the core mandate of this House is uh, devolution, Madam Speaker. We are working to protect the interests of our counties. And, uh, Madam Speaker, from where I sit, if that committee is not functional, which I was chairing, and is not functional now, it means. Uh, this house is almost uh, grinding to a halt. But what I would request uh, the majority leader, why don't you then fill uh, devolution committee as you try to consult on the others? Maybe put, uh, we, uh, you, can put, you can put in members in devolution committee so that at least it, it, can, it can continue running. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Senator Sherargen, what's your point of order? Uh, Madam Speaker, <laughs> Madam Speaker, I remember the minority leader when uh, when you are, I think you were on the seat, uh, Speaker, that time, Madam Speaker, the mi minority leader uh, he requested that those motions were being deferred and then it goes to committee, uh, to Kamkunji for, uh, so that we build a consensus. So I think, uh, I, I remember maybe Senator Moses Wetangula was attending ex exigencies of duties and therefore, he might not have gotten the memo. But I, as far as I know, we agreed that uh, the, 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 the restitution, reconstitution of committees, Madam Speaker, should be done with consensus. But if it comes the way it comes, I can assure you it will fall flat the way it was. The, the one that the minority leader tried to rescue by deferring them. But if they want to bring it now, Madam Speaker, respectfully, we will shoot the same motion down. Uh, Senator Mbua Enoch. Madam Speaker, I, I hear what Senator Kajuang is saying. In fact, Madam Speaker, what I will be proposing myself is that as things stand now, the devolution committee is so critical, so critical. The government is in the process of distributing relief food and, and the the drought mitigation fund across the country. The criteria being used, we don't know. This is about counties. Um, I saw yesterday the Minister for Devolution distributing food to uh, some counties, and my county was not uh, in that list. Madam Speaker, can I ask that maybe uh, Senator Kajuang should actually bring a motion, if that's what needs to be done, for his committee to be properly constituted irrespective of what the majority leader will do on the other committees so that the devolution committee can get down to work and ensure that all Kenyans who are deserving of the, the drought mitigation fund, that fund reaches to those Kenyans as, as the majority leader prepares to do whatever else they want to do with the, the other committees. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator. Senator Wetangula Moses, Senator Wabungoma. Madam Speaker, 
My, while I share the concerns of Moses Kajuang, the distinguished senator of Homa Bay, about the devolution committee, I would want to discourage this piecemeal approach in doing uh, business of the House. Mr. Speaker, the majority leader and the minority leader are in the House. Their whips are available. Other leadership cadre are available. Madam Speaker, instead of allowing a young Senator Chiragay uh, to display rage and uh, shout to Tangusha, we need to work as a house. And the purpose of the whips is to consult members whether they want to move from one committee to another and whether they're comfortable to be in this or that committee. That's the work of whips. And that's how we did things in the last parliament. So we don't want, uh, this house, Madam Speaker, has cultivated some tremendous public confidence and respect. And for us to degenerate into altercations and quarrels and shouting at each other over committees is beneath our dignity. And I would want to truly encourage the leadership. This is a matter that we can do within an hour. Even an adjournment of the house and bringing back the so that uh, those uh, members who have been assigned in new committees, Madam Speaker, can get working. The issue normally is once a member sees his name on the floor that he has been moved from one committee to another, they stop going to that committee where they have been indicated to have been moved out of. So even those committees suffer because of the delay in making the decision. And yet they cannot go to the committees that have been assigned because the House has not approved the movement. So it, is, it cuts both ways. As devolution is suffering, other committees are also suffering. Even if a committee is properly constituted, but constantly meetings are attended by only three senators, it also undermines the credibility and confidence of, of, of the committees. So I want to really urge a distinguished senator for West Pokot and Siaya as the leadership of the House to get their whips in order and get things done uh, Senator Orengo had suggested a Kamkunji, which is a good idea, uh, so that those who uh, have rage and anger like uh, a young Cheragay can uh, be able to, to, to ventilate and uh, be brought to order uh, through explanation, of course, so that we can move forward. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, Senator Minority Leader, Senator James Orengo. Uh, M Madam Speaker, I, I speak to this uh, only because on Tuesday when the matter came before the chamber and I was here and there were separate motions for committees and the panel uh, and that motion regarding the panel, I think that went through and that's why Senator Kenya was sitting on the chair yesterday. But I can assure you had we moved <laughs> with the motion in respect of other committees, including devolution, it would have been shot down. And uh, I could see the sense of, uh, you know, difficulty. In, it's not that people were being malicious, but I think there were some reason, uh, concerns that were raised that were legitimate. For example, Senator Ab Abishiro, uh, I think she raised, when we had a little Kamkunji out here, she raised some very legitimate questions which I think we cannot, uh, we cannot ignore. And uh, uh, we were supposed to have done consultations and have a Kamkunji this week, uh, but that seemed not to be possible. But bef between me and the majority leader, if you're given a little time until Tuesday afternoon, uh, I think the job will, will be done. The difference between this house and the other house, and I prefer the system in the Senate, in the National Assembly, the leadership determines where you go. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, you, if you refuse, that's your shawry. Yeah, but here, committees are committees of the House. It's the House which approves. So however much the leadership asks, uh, works on these committees and the membership, if the House does not approve, it, it amounts to nothing. So I would plead with uh, Senator Kajuan. Uh, who I know the opinion you're undergoing. In fact, I talked at length about the devolution committee, uh, that it, is, it doesn't have sufficient members. Uh, but I think let us have a spirit 
of constituting these committees as committees of the House, uh, not uh, to look for individual or sectarian interests, uh, because when that happens, then it becomes very difficult from constituting committees. I would also plead that, uh, and I, I'm also a culprit as far as uh, that question is concerned, uh, sometimes you move somebody from a committee without consultations, and you do not know that that particular person has a professional or a, almost a div devotional interest to a particular committee. So when you do that movement, it becomes extremely difficult. Uh, so I, I hope uh, working together with the House and with the leader of majority will accomplish this uh, process by uh, Tuesday afternoon. Thank you. Uh, finally, on that, uh, Senator Majority Leader. Just to concur with, uh, with uh, the rest, the members, as they have spoken, on the importance not only of the Committee on Devolution, but also uh, the whole purpose of consulting so that we can agree on who serves where. And Speaker, the headache that is there for whips and for chairs of committees. And I think this is something that in that Kamukunji we should address, Madam Chair, is the fact that members don't attend committees. And there are members who want to be in four committees, five committees, and they hardly appear in any of those committees. So, 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 so I, I want us to look at that. If, if we do, Madam Speaker, what have I said that is out of order? You know, so Mr. Speaker, I just, want, I just wanted for us to agree here that that Kamukunji comes. We, okay, point of information, I can take information. Senator Wetangula. Inform you that as I agree with you, in fact, in the last uh, two, three years, in our security committee, but you have since removed that member, for all the meetings, committee meetings we had, he never attended even one. But when our trip came to Canada, we found him already there. Madam Speaker, you know, miracles still happen. Uh, and, 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 so, and so I agree with members. I agree with the members, but please, let's not, have, let's not have the desire to have more committees than you can handle. Let us make sure that every member at least belongs to two commi standing committees, and the rest, you know, the, the other committees. Think, things like that needs to be the agreement, generally. So, Madam Speaker, I agree, and uh, I look forward to the time when we can conclude uh, with this matter. Thank you. Senator Faria, what's your point of intervention? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. It's just that I wanted to comment about uh, a comment that was made about devolution that we need to, re to distribute relief food. Please, please, we should not re distribute relief food. There is a, there, it is better to distribute cash to people. It has been, uh, research has been done by the organization that I used to work before. Distribution of food stuff is more expensive than distribution of cash. And people are much more empowered when they get cash. Because after, once you, 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 you are given the cash, you, you determine your prioritization. Sometimes there are even areas, like in where I come from, people are being given maize, and they, never, they don't eat maize. So what they used to do is boil and give it to the goats. So let us not give people... The giving of food in relief has been has been has been has been has been yeah, but, overtaken uh, by members. Events. You you must yeah, no you must know the they procedure because yeah. Senator Faria is on a point of is on, on the, a point of order. I mean, okay, okay, I yeah. So let her just complete, then you can make yours. <laughs> so now you want to start arguing, Senator Wambua? 
you know madam speaker madam speaker honorable members please can we have some order madam speaker <laughs> senator faria you know due respect that address is directed to the wrong people what you are saying actually gives credence to the argument on the floor that the devolution committee should be properly constituted and say those things to the minister because telling us that you should not distribute food we don't distribute food you monitor the distribution of whether it is food or it's cash transfer so madam speaker she actually is speaking to my point that constitute the devolution committee properly so that the things that Senator Faria is telling us to do, they can tell the cabinet secretary to do. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Senator Rengo, you didn't have an intervention? Now that the point has been made, uh, I, I wanted really to inform Senator Faria that what you're saying uh, is a big conversation in the international community. Because the experience is that uh, if they give money, uh, the money is stolen. It's easier to steal money uh, in the process uh, than stealing, you know, food. Like FAO, FAO would normally mm. give food stuff. Uh, they will not normally give cash. So until we learn how to deal with corruption in our midst, uh, th these things are still going to be very extremely uh, difficult. But probably it's not the debate now, but I'm just telling you that it, it is... It, it, it is a crisis out there. Otherwise, Biden will give us money to buy Pfizer. But yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I think that that case is settled, and uh, we need Senator Sherarge. Okay, one minute. <laughs> Fari, uh, 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 leader, there, there is a package that has been invested in some places. And even it can be escalated because right now in this country, there is what you can actually give Safaricom the money and the, the, the charges, and it's very clear how that money goes. The, 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 the reason why money is much more important is because it also generates an economic activity around the relief, while relief food doesn't do the same. So, Madam Speaker, uh, in, I know it was in the... She's on a, a point of order. Uh, in, just finish. I, I know that this it was in the context of of, of the devolution committee, but in terms of how this is done, it, actually we have even convinced the organisation I worked for, WFP, to re, uh, 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 you know distribute cash instead of 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 of, of relief food because it was found that if you distributed relief food, the number of people it is adequate to serve. If you do cash, you can do one and a half of the same because of the cost implication of relief food. No, no, that in Kenya, I'm talking Honorable about in Kenya. Senators, we need think, to debate uh, Senator, this because it is something that's affecting our people. Let's bring that to a conclusion. I think uh, that has been canvassed enough. Yeah, I think that has been canvassed enough. The committee should be put in place so that they handle their matter. So that brings us to the end of statements. Next order. Order number eight, motion. Censure of Honorable John K. Munez, Cabinet Secretary for Petroleum and Mining, and Honorable Charles Keter, Cabinet Secretary for Energy. Uh, Senator Sherarge. Are we still on 10 minutes? 15. 10 minutes, we continue. There's, a lot, there's still a lot of interest. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, when I rose to, to seek a statement uh, on the rising cost of fuel in the country, Madam Speaker, I thought it was in the interest of the nation and in the interests of all Kenyans. And I thought that the minister concerned, uh, Minister C.S. John Munez, would have given an attention and opportunity because, as my colleague said yesterday, Madam Speaker, that 
the cost of fuel will always drive the cost of living up. And uh, Madam Speaker, I want to really say that uh, I agree with colleagues that the Minister of Petroleum should and must be censured. But uh, Madam Speaker, the Constitution is very clear. Article 153.3, that any cabinet minister can be invited by this house. And we were shocked. And I raised four issues, Madam Speaker, then. That what were the reasons uh, that led to the increase through IPRA, uh, which is mandated to do their job? What was the role of a petroleum levy fund that should have been used to cushion whenever there is rise in uh, fuel cost in the country. Madam Speaker, I even went ahead and wanted to know the proceeds of Ngamia 1 in Turkana. And you remember, Madam Speaker, there was even a research that was done by a consulting firm called Kafni Klein Associates that indicated that 500 million or thereabout bar barrels of oil were uh, commercially viable in Turkana, Ngamia One project. And uh, Madam Speaker, there was fanfare when this project was being launched by the President uh, on Ngamia One in Turkana. And you remember the UN cry that followed from the locals because of the revenue. We have never known where that fuel goes, Madam Speaker. So we don't know where that fuel that was being mined in uh, Turkana went whether it was used as a cooking oil or a mafta ya kuchipaka. So no one has really told us, Madam Speaker, that where that fuel is. And Kenyans knew that we were getting fuel from Gamia 1, Madam Speaker. And there were even plans to construct 845 kilometers of pipeline from all the way from Turkana all the way to, to Mombasa through the, the famous Lapset uh, projects. And therefore, those were my few issues, the four key issues that I really wanted to know in my statement, uh, Madam Speaker. And of course, to know that the question, and I thank the mover of the motion, the Senate Minority Leader, uh, for saying that the cost of fuel in the country is high in Kenya than Tanzania and Uganda, yet they get their fuel through Mombasa Port, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I am a bit cautious when it comes to censuring the CS in charge of energy, Charles Kete. Because I, I went and did some research and look at the executive order number one of 2016. That docket was under CS Charles Kete. I don't know why Senator Ledema is looking at me. That was CS Charles Kete. But that executive order number one of 2018 and 2020, that State Department of Petroleum was moved to CS John Munez. And when that reorganization was done, one was the petroleum policy was moved to the Ministry of Petroleum, strategic policy, petroleum stock, uh, market, marketing, oil and gas, import and exports. Uh, export of fuel and import of the same, licensing, marketing, and handling of petroleum products, quality control. These were put by executive order in the reorganization of number one, uh, number one executive order number one of 2018 and number one of 2020. And you remember the CS Charles Keter, Madam Speaker, that even had the courtesy of sending a letter to the House to try and explain but of course, he didn't read Article 153.3, where he knew that the House of Parliament, either Senate of National Assembly, can summon him, can, can invite and summon him at the same time, uh, Madam Speaker. So I think, uh, in, uh, in all fairness and honest, uh, Madam Speaker, this issue of petroleum lies squarely on the Ministry of Mining and Petroleum. And therefore, Madam Speaker, when you look at uh, the, the executive of order number one, Senator, number, number two, of can I, because uh, my, my time? <coughs> Why is Senator Wajir shouting and this is not a marketplace? Uh, yes. I don't as, speak as the one controlling uh, the debate. I've already given Senator Wachangula but is it point of order or information? information. Okay. Uh, must oblige Wajir. <laughs> <laughs>
May, Madam Speaker, thank you. I want to inform uh, the distinguished young senator, my good friend, and a very objective one at that, that the censure on Minister Keter is not about petroleum. Thank you. And the Hansard will inform you and bear the house and the move of the motion out that while you brought your statement on petroleum, matters ensued in the debate allowed by the speaker that apart from fuel skyrocketing in prices, the cost of electricity in the country was unbearable. And the speaker, not anybody else, directed that the committee of the whole invites the two ministers for petroleum and for energy. So Senator Keter was being invited to come and answer questions on the high cost of electricity. And to crown it all, uh, Honorable Senator Cherarge, through the chair, a copy of the Hansard was also sent to him accompanying the invitation to tell him what exactly he was coming to answer to. He never turned up. He never sent a representative. He never explained. He never even apologized. We only saw him on TV waving an executive order that was totally irrelevant in the circumstances. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. I will take that uh, information with a pinch of salt. But n that one notwithstanding, Madam Speaker, is, um, that is why I was insisting on the four issues. And I remember, if I'm right, Madam Speaker, the chair of energy, Senator Efre Maina, indicated that there was a letter from C.S. Charles Keter saying he did not know why he was being summoned before the Senate. And you know, someone says and invitations are two different things. This is a cabinet secretary, Madam Speaker, that even the chair of Senate committee, and you were there, I, I don't know whether you were there, Madam Speaker, but you raised the issue of electricity and then, that raised that, um, that C.S. Charles Keter has been appearing before this committee, and I have so many questions and answers from the committee. The only C.S. that the, the cabinet, the, the, the committee uh, flagged out was C.S. John Munez. And therefore, Madam Speaker, I think the, 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 the clerk of the committee indicated that there was a letter from C.S. Keter saying he did not know the reason why he was being summoned. You know, this was not an invitation. If it was an invitation, it was different. Because when you are summoned, the Powers and Privileges Act is very clear on the implication of the summonses as opposed to the invitation that was the, 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 Madam Speaker. So, uh, Madam Speaker, I, I think uh, my learned senior, Senator James Orengo, should have been very clear because the answer that was given, and I read that answer, and I have it here, Madam Speaker, courtesy of your office, is that it was, uh, it was directed by the Speaker. The same, same answer. But there was no specific questions as to what the CS of energy was to come and do, as opposed as to the CS of petroleum, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I, I, I agree that any person should be, I, I think Article 125, they, they, this house has a power to summon. But also we must be honest. We must follow the law. Everybody has faith in, in Senate, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the, the point I'm trying to raise, Madam Speaker, here is... is I, I, Uh, Senator Speaker, for Trukana, you have a button there for intervention. So if you need a, a point of order, you just have to press it without uh, cutting up your hand. I, so I give you the opportunity. <laughs> and, uh, Senator you Shiradge, will you, you will have your half okay. a minute left. Uh, left. Need, yes. The reason why Honorable Sergei I see you're making a lot of, um, a lot of hoovla about um, C.S. Keter being, uh, being summoned by the, by the Energy Committee. But I want you to know that uh, he was summoned because we wanted him to come and answer questions about the high electricity tariffs 
that are actually affecting Kenyans and shutting down our economy, shutting down businesses. That's why we summoned him. He did not appear. Because he did not appear and we are operating on the orders of the High Court, he got what uh, he had to have according to the law. Thank you. Uh, Senator Sheragate, please finalize. No, no, Madam Speaker, but you need to appreciate that my time has been eaten away. We have held your you, you are left with one Madam, minute. Madam Speaker, it just is in conclusion, there. but this conclusion, and you know, being my neighbor, I hope you'll add me two minutes. Madam Speaker, just I wanted to say, we must follow the procedure and rules. You know, it was a summons, as opposed as to invitation. If the Speaker had invited, it would have been different as opposed to summonses. Because someone says it's a different animal altogether as opposed as to invitation. I agree the danger that we have in this country is the high cost of fuel. It must be addressed. I agree the issue of uh, high electricity bills in this country must be, be addressed. Yes, Senator Orengo, I think there is a misleading somewhere yeah. here. Needs to be corrected. Madam Speaker, is it right that uh, a lawyer who has been admitted to the High Court the other day, but this should be, uh, you know, a small knowledge? Uh, because, Madam Speaker, what is before the House are not proceedings of the Power, Powers and Privileges Committee. It is not. This is a motion of censure, and you can be censured on anything. But already, I know the Committee on Energy, they have already acted on the basis of powers under the Constitution and sanctioned the Minister uh, Keter, I think. Yeah, they, they fined him half a million shillings. There was a process where he should have gone to defend himself. But this process now is not about censuring. It's, it's not about uh, uh, powers and privileges. It's not about a punishment. Uh, is a censure motion. So I think it's absolutely in, uh, out of order to misunderstand what is before the, the House today. This is not the Powers and Privileges Committee. And you're meeting... <laughs> minority leader, Madam Speaker, the minority leader is also misunderstanding what I'm just saying. And I'm just saying that when this statement had come up, it is not that the CS of, of energy or uh, petroleum had declined to appear. Then you can issue someone says like that. That's only, I'm, I'm arguing on the issue of rules and procedure. You might not like the person who is in that office, but you have the right to defend. And Senator Orengo, in conclusion, knows that the reason we have high price of fuel and electricity is because of the handshake government. They are the ones who should be addressing these things instead of, 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 of defending. So, Madam Speaker, let us put the blame where... Senator uh, Moses Kajuang, Senator for uh, Omabe. Madam Speaker, I rise to support the essential motion against the two cabinet secretaries. I also rise to support the first part of the motion where Senate is expressing its concern over the increasing price of fuel and um, the attendant cost of living. But Madam Speaker, before I delve into the details of the motion, allow me to convey my condolences to the families that lost loved ones in the tragic boat, uh, uh, boat uh, accident that happened in Homer Bay Town. As we speak, eight bodies have been recovered. Search and rescue efforts are still ongoing, and Madam Speaker, once we settle all these issues, these will form a good basis for discussion on the preparedness of our county governments to cope with such disasters and the utilization of emergency funds that are established by statute uh, because we have seen politicians are the ones who've been raising money to finance the search and rescue efforts and yet each and every county government is allowed by the PFM Act to establish an emergency fund to respond in such situations. Madam Speaker, coming back to the motion, this last week I visited Mfangano Island. Madam Speaker, Mfangano relies on diesel power uh, to light it up. 
because it's far from the mainland, so you cannot lay cables from uh, uh, the, the traditional grid. And so when you increase the price of diesel, definitely the fisher folk in Mfangano are going to suffer. But I'm speaker, for you to move from the mainland to Mfangano Island, you have to take a boat. And uh, because of the long distance, and because of the fury of the, weed, uh, of the wind and the waves in that part of the lake, uh, we no longer use uh, uh, paddled canoes. We have to use um, motorized uh, boats. And for some reason, Madam Speaker, the people of Mfangano are, are wondering, why does it make sense for the government to provide free ferries at the coast in Likoni and not provide government ferries for the people of Mfangano? Why must it be left to the private sector? Who is milking and fleecing the residents of Mfangano Island? It becomes almost impossible to build a house in Mfangano. Cement is bought in the mainland. By the time you transport it to Mfangano Island, it comes to about 1,000 shillings. Yet the people on the mainland can buy cement a bag at 600 shillings. And so, Madam Speaker, when the price of petrol goes up, we are hurting the people of Mfangano. Because the grid in Mfangano is not that expansive. It means that more people are still using paraffin to light. Now, all those children in Mfangano Island who aspire to get out of that island into a life in Nairobi, a life in the cities of light, these children have to use paraffin lights. And when the price of paraffin goes up, it means that there could be one or two other child, one or two other girl in Fangano Island who would prefer to get married to a fisherman rather than to stay in school and study. Madam Speaker, this increase in fuel prices is hurting the fisher folk. Perhaps it's hurting them more than any other person in this country because almost everything we do requires fuel. For us to fish omena, the delicacy that finds its way on our tables, the delicacy that feeds the chicken that we eat. When you eat chicken at KFC, that chicken has been raised on omena. When you have your nice German shepherds at home, they eat a formula made up of omena. Omena has found its way in the food chain, in the value chain of almost every other, you know, any other nutritional aspect, omena is there. For us to catch omena, we must fish at night. And we need lanterns to attract the omena. We are hurting the people of Fangano, the omena fisherman. And Madam Speaker, once that omena of fish has landed, for it to be preserved, because the national government, for some reason, has decided to take billions of shillings and take to Sagana, instead of putting money in the lake, which produces close to 90% of Kenya's fish output, we don't have cold storage facilities. And so our women must fry that fish. Our women must find ways of preserving that fish. And all that is energy intensive. Madam Speaker, the CSs, be it petroleum, be it energy, and I, I could hear the, uh, how uh, conflicted Senator Chirarge was on the subject of the CS for energy. But the CS for energy must also tell us why there is so much regulatory overreach in the energy sector. Not too long ago, Remba Island, another island adjacent to Mfangano, some investors decided to set up a solar farm to provide energy, power, lighting to the residents of Remba because the government has failed. The people of Remba pay taxes. They expect they are going to get electricity just like the people of Gatundu and the people of Nandi and the people of Mombasa. But since independence, they've not seen power. An investor set up a solar farm. What did the uh, energy regulator do? They came and shut it down, saying that these guys had not paid tariffs and taxes. What kind of ministry is that? What kind of overreach is that? And those are the conversations that we need to be having with these cabinet secretaries. Madam Speaker, in, on the hills where you have the Sondu Miriu hydro uh, generating plant, an investor from the United States intended to set up a 40 megawatt solar farm they were ready when the, the delegation, the Kenyan delegation, went to the UN General Assembly a few years ago. They signed an agreement on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly. And the American government was willing to finance the project. These investors were frustrated, and they had to pick their things and go back to the US. Why? Because the energy regulator could not agree with them on uh, uh, you know, those power purchase agreements. And yet, 40 megawatts of solar, Madam Speaker, would have created employment 
not just for the people of Homabe and Kisumu who fall along uh, Nyakwere, but it would have created employment for many of our budding graduates from Jomo Kenyatta University and Nairobi University who are studying electrical and electronic engineering and they don't have uh, jobs. Senator Cherege, what is your point of intervention? Point of intervention, Madam Speaker, is on relevance. Because even if you read the answer, I appreciate what uh, Senator Kajuang is saying, but if you read the answer, the answer that was taken to the Ministry of Energy did not include the issue of regulation within the energy sector. So it's irrelevant to allude that the Minister of Energy has refused to provide clarification and answers whenever needed on the issue of regulation as he is talking about the solar energy. Senator Olekina, what's your point of order? Madam Speaker, I rise on a point of order on the relevance of my good friend, Senator. Senator, what's his name? <laughs> Gerard Gay. Because, Madam Speaker, if Senator Gerard Gay is keen to listen, to the way Senator Moses Kajuang is explaining the role of the Ministry of Energy. Yesterday when I stood here, I pointed out to the role that the Minister of Energy plays when it comes to the issue of UPRA, the regulator. EPRA. Is it UPRA or EPRA? EPRA. <laughs> and, and I think, and, and I think yeah, Senator Cherege is missing the point. What Senator Moses Kajuang is telling us is that when a cabinet secretary is someone to appear before this house, they must respect that. That is issue number one. So let us not mix the point. And he's also explaining clearly how Kenyans are suffering. Everywhere. You know, everywhere. So I think this is what we should be listening to because we're here to represent our people. You know, the relevance is that people are suffering. And I think that's the point that you should be taking home. Uh, I mean, you're disturbing. Ma 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 Madam Speaker, if you allow me to proceed, the, the first resolution that these, the first, Madam Speaker, the first resolution that, that these motions sought was that the Senate expresses its grave concern on the unprecedented increase in fuel and electricity costs. Madam Speaker, if Senator uh, Cherebe... Senator Fonande, can you allow Kachwang to finish his, uh, his term? No, the, the reason I'm saying that is that I've also been following this debate. And I think we have two things that are coming into conflict. Your statement and the sense of motion. And there are two different things that if you look at in the answer, they are different. The sense of motion, please sit down, the sense of motion is looking at the two ministers for two different agendas. But uh, your statement had nothing to do with energy. So don't worry, don't apologize to the Minister of Energy on their behalf because the Minister of Energy, the Minister of Energy was part of the censure motion. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted, I wanted to bring that one. I wanted to bring that to your information because I think that is what we have been arguing about. So let's allow, because a censure motion, se, se, Senator, Senator Gerard Gay, I understand you, but what we are saying is a censure motion is a motion that is a freelance motion. Let people express themselves. Yeah, uh, finish, and, uh, unless you have information that we don't have. The, the, Madam Speaker, I, I, no, I no. hope uh, the disruptions by is Senator Chirargeri shall be compensated. Se, se, we will compensate you, but I want to know what, what it is. Is it uh, information, or are you understanding first where we are coming from? Yeah. Give, give, give him the mic and, and, and preserve the minute for... Madam Speaker, and I hope this house is run by you, not people who are shouting like a marketplace. Madam Speaker, my point of concern was one, that in the answer that was presented before the two ministers, it indicated on the issue of electricity bills and what have you. But what Senator Kajuang is alluding to is that the minister in charge of energy has refused to answer some of the questions on issue of regulatory within that ministry. No, no, no. So he is not being relevant. 
That was my only contention because the relevancy is the, in the motion that was presented by the Senate Majority Leader. My, minority, sorry, Minority yeah. Leader. Uh, and Senate, that is, Senator, Madam Speaker, and that is Senate. my contention. I understand that the Minister of Energy had nothing to do with my statement on issues of petroleum and uh, yeah. fuel rates. I'm but my that. point is the relevance on what is on the motion so that we don't mislead Kenyans by telling them that the Ministry of Energy or Ministry of Petroleum has refused to answer any other question. Apart from what we are, we are, we are debating As on the floor. Sen Senator Gerard K., we are not going to correct ourselves on contribution on a motion of censure. A motion of censure is freelance in the way you talk. Yeah, it is what you feel. Because people, yeah, it is, wh it is what you feel. So let's get to know what Kajuang thinks about this censure. Because censure is censure. Yeah, censure is censure. And the language has to be that of censure. And, uh, and it was well moved. So let's give his last two minutes. Is it two minutes? To uh, Madam Please, Speaker, yes, Senator Cherarge has taken away close to five of my minutes on irrelevancies while lobbying for relevance. Madam Speaker, this motion expresses, the Senate is expressing its grave concern over increase, increased electricity prices. And Madam Speaker, when I give the illustration that the ministry has frustrated investors who wish to put up a solar farm, we know that solar would be cheaper than the power that is generated using diesel and those other opaque power sharing agreements. And so I think, Senator Chirargei, you can filibuster and hold brief for CS Keter in another forum and not in the Senate, because otherwise it brings shame and it demeans this House on a very important motion. But, Madam Speaker, going, going forward, M M Madam Speaker, um, there is an issue of executive accountability Please, uh, Senator Gerard Gay. Uh, Senator but, Gerard Gay. Senator Gerard Gay, you, you had your own opportunity. Okay, point of order from uh, Senator Rengo. He was earlier than you. No, you're obviously holding brief for people. Mr. Speaker, you have just demonstrated I did need to say anything. When I press the right button, you know exactly what I wanted to do or to say. I'm rising on a point of order that the conduct of the senator from Nandi is now disrupting the whole debate and is a serious debate. And Madam Speaker, what I was taught, you can make noise or make comments or keep on talking when it is another member talking. But when the speaker is speaking, the House must always listen in silence. I pray to you. Otherwise, we can never have a debate in this House. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, it is not only Senator Charigai who can keep on shouting point of order and point of order. We can also do it. Uh, but you know, the effect of it is that it's disrupting debate. We are trying to follow a very eloquent speech from Senator Kajuang. Just as I followed his very eloquent speech, uh, please give us time and space. I pray. Uh, uh, to thank to the you, debate. Senator Orengo. Senator Jeruyot, Aaron? Madam Speaker, you know two wrongs don't make a right. First of all, the House was enjoying very, the very brilliant presentation by Senator Moses Kajuang. And we need to put it on record that he went to the best university in this country, Mo University, where you are also, where you are also associated. That's why, that's why he was doing so well. But that's, then, that's where eloquence comes from. And, and not, so I, I wonder also where Chirarge picked his bad habits from, because he went to that un university. But then, Madam Speaker, this is the point. To save this house, I want you to issue a ruling, actually, that any time somebody rises on a point of order, let them cite the relevant uh, point of order, standing order. Uh, sorry, standing order, that the member they're, they're interrupting has fallen afoul of, so that we, we end this business of people rising. Having said that, Madam Speaker, I only regret that Senator Moses Kajuang, my good friend, lost his school and said something about Senator Chirarge that, that shouldn't be left on record. It's not fair to say that a colleague is holding brief for a minister. We may hold difference of opinion, but it's not fair on Senator Chirarge. I know he can do many things, 
but holding brief is not one of those things. So <laughs> on that one, my good uh, friend, th uh, thank you. I think if I you withdrew and apologize, then we can proceed peacefully, Madam Speaker. Uh, th th thank you, Senator Cheriot. Uh, I think because of too many points of order from Gerard Gay himself, that he was drowned and I didn't even hear that one. Senator Watangula? Madam Speaker, uh, I rise to counsel my distinguished young senator friend that, uh, you know, experience counts. And sometimes you may think that by engaging in obstruction of debate, you are gaining some points and uh, some relevance. You are not. You brought a statement to the House. The rules of the House say that once you bring a statement to the House, you don't own it. It becomes the property of the House and takes its own life. So don't try uh, through you, Madam Speaker, to chaperon and navigate the debate towards a desired goal that you have come with. You sat in this house from yesterday, and everybody, including one of the most eloquent uh, debaters on your side, Senator for Kericho, I have a lot of regard for him. And I'm sure he could have been driven by the same intentions that are driving you to say the things you are saying. But he saw the bigger picture, the nation, and he didn't say those things. He spoke and touched people's hearts. I want to encourage uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator Wetang. <laughs> I want to encourage you to learn. <laughs> the point of order from Senator Jiriot nullifies those ones also. Because the, that's not uh, advice and colleagues. is not part of the standing orders either. <laughs> Senator Moses Kajwang, please finish up. Uh, can you, can, can you, I, I didn't, I didn't yeah. get, I didn't hear you, but if you did say that somebody is uh, holding brief, that is dangerous for this house. Yeah, Madam Speaker, indeed it would be dangerous for a member to hold brief for a member of the executive. Madam Speaker, the, 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 the manner in which, the manner in which this house What, what, what exactly holds. did you say? Did you say no, he's I, holding brief or no, you said... I agree with you, Madam Speaker, uh, that it is dangerous for a member to hold brief. For a member of the executive, uh, so. I, I, would, speaker, I, would, if, I would like to study me. that answer later. Uh, yes, I will I will study that answer later, and uh, Senator Gerard Gay, you will get your right if uh, once if he actually said that, because uh, unfortunately, uh, you are uh, the one who drowned me in. Uh, I, yeah, and, and I, I, didn't, I didn't get that. Okay, can you finish th th thank you, you Madam your last Speaker. two minutes? Your Madam Speaker, minutes? this experience that we've had with the two uh, cabinet secretaries has just uh, helped us to see how this house can hold the executive uh, in a presidential system to account. And Madam Speaker, if we continue using the Committee of the Whole as a tool for holding the executive uh, to account, I think it could be a brilliant idea that we can achieve halfway of what you have in Prime Minister's questions, because what then we can do is instead of calling this, the, uh, the ministers before plenary, the Speaker can always call the House as a committee of the whole, and we can designate a day every week where the members of the executive can come here, and we can have a good uh, you know, protocol for questioning uh, such that there are no hecklers and supporters of the executive. We allow the leadership of the House to put the questions, we allow the House to put the questions in advance, and we can grill, we can roast members of the executive without going into that small committee thing. And Madam Speaker, yesterday a lot of people sp spoke about the deficiencies and inefficiencies of the committee system. I hope that the next Senate is going to use a committee of the whole approach to hold the executive to account. And Madam Speaker, I don't think there's anything that stops this House from calling even the President to appear before a committee of the whole, because the Constitution gives Senate or Parliament that power to summon anybody, including the Presidency. Finally, Madam Speaker, we must always, every time we are reconstituting our committees, we don't think of the Delegated Legislation Committee as a, an important committee of this House. And today, fuel prices keep shifting because of some regulations that were passed by Parliament. We need to strengthen our Delegated Legislation Committee 
strengthen not just the membership, but even the technical competence and capacity that comes from the office of the clerk. They will be dealing with regulations on petroleum. The next day, they'll be dealing with regulations on agriculture. And the next day, there'll be regulations on health. I've realized, Madam Speaker, that because the executive is now doing a lot of legislation through regulation, we need to strengthen that committee. The formula that we are using currently, I refer to it as an opaque algorithm, because in 2020, when global oil prices were at a negative, we never saw a corresponding fall in oil prices in this country. And that regulation needs to be reviewed. Even as we talk about the other levies and taxes, we need to make sure that the delegated legislation and the Energy Committee goes back and comes back with a solution. The last two days, we've been whining as a house. We have really not offered solutions to the nation. I hope that after this censure motion, we shall get down to work and come up with good suggestions that can guide this country, that can offer hope to the residents of Remba, the residents of Nyakwere, the residents of Mfangano, and that young girl who is forced to drop out of school because they cannot afford paraffin for her studies this evening. Madam Speaker, I support the censure motion. Unfortunately, these are former senators, and the Minister for Petroleum used to have good manners. In fact, when he was chair of Ford Kenya, he used to have better manners. I think uh, these bad manners must have started uh, when he defected and, and, and went into the wilderness. Madam Speaker, I support. Thank you, Senator Milgo Alice. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for this uh, opportunity to also uh, speak to this uh, censure motion, and I understand by thanking uh, the minority leader, uh, Senator, Senator Senior Counsel Jim Sorengo. Actually, this is a, a matter of uh, great concern, especially when it touches uh, power and, and fuel that goes to affect uh, the populace. Uh, three quarters of the populace in this country. Madam Speaker, uh, this is a challenge coming at the heels of COVID-19 that has actually destroyed livelihoods. It has broken business chains, as well as uh, affecting uh, even uh, uh, the livelihoods of people meeting the basic needs. Madam Speaker, uh, when we speak about fuel and, and power, Madam Speaker, this, uh, we are actually speaking to a commodity, or commodity that touches each and every area of the livelihoods of our people. It affects activities such as movement, it affects food prices, it affects cooling, as well as health and protection, and even investments, Madam Speaker. In fact, uh, if such a condition will continue, we'll find many cases of suicide, as we've been seeing of late, we find mental health cases increasing because of the fact that uh, these people cannot meet their basic needs. Madam Speaker, uh, many investors have been lost to our neighboring countries uh, in this country because of the fact that uh, fuel prices have been escalating, as well as power, which actually affects uh, investment activities and actually uh, other countries such as uh, 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 Tanzania, Uganda, we find that power prices, fuel prices, very low. And that actually takes away the investors that we are supposed to get in this country. And this also ends up in making our youths that constitute three quarter, or rather 75 percent of our population losing jobs, Mr. S uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, uh, as fuel prices continue to escalate, this touches uh, very many uh, sectors, even including uh, farming. As I'm speaking right now, Madam Speaker, uh, even the flour by farmers, to flour one acre of a uh, piece of land, that used to be done uh, at a cost of Kenya shillings 3,000, has now gone up to 6,500. This means that uh, the farmers are going to keep up uh, sending this country to become a food relief country, uh, Madam Speaker, because of uh, lack of food protection in our country. Madam Speaker, I want to say that as I'm even speaking right now, uh, the uh, second payment of tea, that is popularly known as bonus in Kericho and tea growing areas has, has just been uh, released. 
and it is found that uh, the prices are so low. And the reason as far for this is that uh, the production price has gone up because of high fuel cost as well as power. I'm sure these farmers uh, will end up either brooding the crop or in this case uh, just uh, letting it uh, without tending to it, Madam Speaker. And in this case, we have been uh, saying that uh, uh, farming, tea, coffee, and the such like, actually brings or improves economy in our country. Madam Speaker, more often than not, uh, when we summon uh, CSS, uh, it is quite unfortunate that uh, they rarely attend to our summons, they rarely attend to our meetings, and sometimes others, we have had to get uh, others telling us that why should we be having duplications when the National Assembly has summoned them over certain issues, they would feel that they should not come to the Senate. Madam Speaker, uh, Article 125 gives power to aid the House or these committees to actually summon, uh, to, to summon anybody uh, to answer or to provide evidence, information on any matter. And of course, this article uh, gives power such as the one of the High Court. And it does not, uh, in this case, guarantees or rather makes the CSS not to attend to our summons, Madam Speaker. Sometimes you get to the offices of others and they'll turn new pack even before you end at those offices as if you are going to attend to your own issues. Madam Speaker, despite the fact that we represent uh, the people of this country, uh, some of the CSS have taken it upon themselves that they shall pledge loyalty maybe to the appointing authority only and just let, um, let any other issues that we are taking as representatives uh, to just uh, be left out, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to say uh, this House had been having a challenge very much similar to this one, even with the governors, but then this one here was cured by the civil appeal 2004 of 2015 case that actually uh, let the governors realize that they are able, uh, they can delegate duties, but not abdicate their supervisory and accounting role. And that is why right now we have, uh, we can summon governors with ease, uh, unlike the CSS. Madam Speaker, uh, these CSS, uh, uh, in this case, ignoring the fact that even Article 35 of the Constitution allows uh, this House to summon or allows the people of this country to get information from any institution uh, for that matter, uh, things affecting their lives, like when we have uh, fuel prices uh, going high, Madam Speaker, and in this case, I think a decent motion has come at the right time, and this shall go a long way to actually become a game changer in the sense that I'm sure it will be a awarding example to the rest of the CSS, so that come the next time when we summon them, I think they'll be able to attend to our summons. Furthermore, they are holding institutions on behalf of the people of this country, just like uh, the representatives of parliaments. Madam Speaker, if and every Kenyan right now is suffering, and these uh, two issues are a matter of grave concern, and I hope at the end of this, we shall be able to, or something should be done so that these two CSS will be able to appear in this house and speak to the issues fuel and power, Madam Speaker. Otherwise, life of the people of, of this country, especially because COVID-19 is still ravaging the lives of people, will actually uh, bring challenges to our people, and we shall even see more challenges. We will not be speaking about food only. We will be speaking about health matters because we have people breaking down as a result of not uh, managing to meet their basic needs. Madam Speaker, I support uh, this motion. Uh, thank you, Senator. Honorable Senators, we must reach the end today of this uh, motion. I'm going to appeal that if you are able to do five minutes, it will help us a lot. Uh, you know we have been given coverage yesterday and today. We will not be given tomorrow. It, it, it will have gone still. So we want to finish and we want everybody to have an opportunity to, to say what they would like to say. Senator Malala Cleofas, Wagung. Five minutes, please. 
Y Faikam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I stand to support this censor motion, uh, tabled by Senator Orengo, and on a matter that is very, very, very sensitive to this country at the moment. Madam Speaker, it is sad that Parliament can summon a Cabinet Secretary, and uh, that Cabinet Secretary refuses to come before Parliament. Article 125, read together with Article 153 of the Constitution, gives Parliament the mandate to call for any evidence and also compels the Cabinet Secretaries to appear before the relevant uh, Parliament committees, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to remind the Cabinet Secretaries who had been summoned before these House, and to be specific, the Cabinet Secretary for Petroleum and the Cabinet Secretary for Energy, that we have had more powerful Cabinet Secretaries who have served in your dockets and have honored summons to this very important House, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to remind them that in the previous dispensation, we had even the vice president leading the, uh, the, the, the government business, responding to questions brought by people who have been elected. Article 1 of this constitution is very clear, that the sovereign power of the people will be delegated to elected leaders and certain organs of this uh, uh, government, Madam Speaker. The executive is not an exception. The powers the cabinet secretaries are exercising are powers delegated to them under Article 1, Madam Speaker. And therefore, it is important for them to know that when they are summoned to come to Parliament, let them honor the summons because they are coming to be accountable to the people of Kenya. That said and done, Madam Speaker, Kenyans were unhappy when the announcement by the Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority announced an increase on petroleum products and the pump prices, Madam Speaker, went high on petrol by eight shillings and on kerosene by, say, uh, 12 shillings, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it is sad that as we speak right now, the Boda Boda riders in Kakamega are unable to get their money. Most of these Boda Boda riders in Kakamega, Madam Speaker, they have taken their motorcycles on loan. They pay on a daily basis. Some of these Boda Boda riders are supposed to pay 300 shillings daily, yet they can't even manage to get that money when they do their businesses, Madam Speaker. And therefore, any increase on petrol, Madam Speaker, is really affecting uh, these young people who are doing the Boda Boda uh, business, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it is very sad that as we speak right now, Kerosene prices have been hiked, Madam Speaker. We have old mamas who do not have electricity in their houses. When you go to the slums of Shibale in Mumias, you will get women using koroboys, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, if you increase prices of kerosene, you are oppressing these very people who depend on us, Madam Speaker. And therefore, it is our responsibility as legislators to cushion these people who elected us to come and represent them. Madam Speaker, what are the issues that we need to be tackling so that this incident does not recur in the subsequent month, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, the taxation regime on petroleum products must be reviewed. It is sad, Madam Speaker, and it is baffling that almost 70% of the pump price comprises of taxes, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, per every litre, and it's important Kenyans to know, that in every litre that we sell to our Kenyans, we have 21 shillings and 95 cents as exercise duty, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we have 18 shillings per litre being charged as road maintenance levy, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this money 
we've not seen it being used appropriately, Madam Speaker. As the people of Kakamega are paying 18 shillings per litre, Madam Speaker, the Lurambi Navaholo Road has stayed for 10 years without being completed, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as the people of uh, Kakamega are paying uh, uh, road maintenance levy, Madam Speaker, the Mumias Bungoma Road is very narrow. It has never been expanded, Madam Speaker. And therefore, these monies must be accountable, Madam Speaker. People must account for these monies that we are charging the common Mwanainchi. Madam Speaker, in every litre, we have what we call petroleum development levy, Madam Speaker. We know very well that tallow oil is no longer working, Madam Speaker. We have duplication of taxation in this formula, Madam Speaker. And therefore, I am calling for a review and a transparent way in which we are going to come up with formulas that are going to charge our people. But it must be said, Madam Speaker, and we must remind Kenyans, in 2018, financial year, when we are passing the finance bill, 2018-2019, 8% on all petroleum products was passed in the National Assembly. It must also be said here, Madam Speaker. And I want to thank uh, Senator Orengo for coming up with this motion, yes. But also to remind him that his party was part of the people who increased 8% on all petroleum products, Madam Speaker. And therefore, even as he brings this sense of motion, let us see the sincerity in leaders in this country speaking and acting and being sincere in what they are saying, Madam Speaker. Why it not for those legislators in the, in the National Assembly to pass that 8% increment, we wouldn't be suffering uh, these uh, uh, painful uh, 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 fuel prices that we have right now, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it is important that... As we move forward, Madam Speaker, we do not degenerate this discussion into wanting to cushion the CS who is inclined to a certain a political affiliation and the CS who is uh, uh, favorable to certain people, Madam Speaker. I have seen uh, honorable members trying to come here, Madam Speaker, and trying to absolve certain people from blame, Madam Speaker. I think this matter is beyond party affiliations, Madam Speaker. As we speak right now, let us defend Kenyans in general, and not Kenyans who are, uh, Kenyans are not divided. And I want to uh, say, Madam Speaker, I like what my brother, Senator Sakaja, always says, that a child in Turukana suffers the same hunger as a child in uh, Shamahoho in Viiga County. A mother in, uh, in Wasingishu has the same labor pains with a mother in Kirinyaga, Madam Speaker. And therefore, a Kenyan is a Kenyan, Madam Speaker. And therefore, when we bring important matters on the floor of this house, matters that affect the common Mwanaishi, let us not degenerate our arguments and our debates into political parties' affiliation, Madam Speaker. Otherwise, Madam, Madam Speaker, I want to join my colleagues in saying that cabinet secretaries are not above the law. And I want to say Article 154.2b is the genesis of this problem whereby a cabinet secretary can only be dismissed by the appointing authority, which is the, who is the president, Madam Speaker. I think as we shall be moving forward, these are some of the issues that we shall be looking into. And uh, I know uh, some of these uh, solutions were already encapsulated in the BBI proposals. However, Madam Speaker, that process was mismanaged, and there we are. We are still uh, uh, the same place we are. But I want to believe that the young leaders of this republic, the likes of Akina Sakaja, the likes of Akina Gay, the likes of Akina Malala, will one day change this constitution. I have not forgotten my brother, Senator Wambua, from uh, uh, Kitui, Madam Speaker. Will one day make sure that we remove all the inconsistencies of the Constitution so that we cushion our people. We have seen cabinet secretaries wanting even to lecture elected leaders in function, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I was elected with 438,000 people in Kakamega. An appointee cannot purport to lecture me on issues of representation, Madam Speaker. And therefore, let them know 
that we are mandated to oversight them. The Constitution is very clear. Article 96 gives me as the Senator of Kakamega mandate to oversight the executive. And therefore, when I summon any cabinet secretary to this house, let him pack his files quickly and run to this house, Madam Speaker. Because I've got the power of the people. Thank, Thank you, you and Senator. Me. Thank you, Senator. Your time up. You have taken care of the 10 minutes. Senator Wambua Enoch, Kyo. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, from the word go, um, I stand in support of this motion of censure by the minority leader. Madam Speaker, I will have very few things to say because a lot of things have been said by my colleagues. But I must begin, Madam Speaker, by making it very, very clear that governments across the world exist uh, to cushion uh, citizens uh, from hardships of life, uh, to secure lives and property of their people, and to make the day after today a better day for everyone. Any government that acts otherwise is a government that is in the business of losing its own legitimacy. But on speaker, I also need to clarify uh, something, and I don't see Senator Cheragay here. That, but on speaker, we are not here to defend any sectarian interest or any affiliations. On this matter, Madam Speaker. We speak as representatives of the people of Kenya from our respective counties who are suffering decisions made by the executive. Madam Speaker, it is important to note, and it's actually a shame of association, that the two cabinet secretaries that we are talking about today are former senators. And they sat in this very house to represent the people that brought them here. And now they are, that they are seated elsewhere, they think that they have become a lot more special, a lot more powerful than the Senate in which they served. Madam Speaker, I want to draw the attention of C.S. Keter and C.S. Munez uh, to the provisions of Article 129 of the Constitution on the principles of executive authority. Madam Speaker, Article 1292 says that executive authority shall be exercised in a manner compatible with the principle of service to the people of Kenya and for their well-being and benefit. Madam Speaker, when you look at the article of the Constitution establishing the Parliament of the Republic of Kenya, Article 93, um, 94, Madam Speaker, uh, that uh, talks about Parliament uh, manifesting the diversity of the nation and representing the will of the people and exercising their sovereignty. Madam Speaker, what this Senate was trying to do in requiring the Cabinet Secretaries to appear before a committee of the whole was simply in exercise of the sovereign authority of the people of Kenya to understand why fuel prices have gone so high, why the cost of electricity is unbearable. That's the only thing that we sought to know from the cabinet secretaries. Now, Madam Speaker, one of the cabinet secretaries 
responsible for petroleum uh, cabinet secretary Munez has presided over an increase in fuel prices. The other cabinet secretary has presided over the high cost of electricity. And when they are called to account and shed some light for the benefit of Kenyans, they refuse to turn up and begin to give all manner of excuses for their non-appearance. Madam Speaker, I stand on the floor of this house to say shame on them. Shame on them because, Madam Speaker, the power that they think they have is derived from the people. And it must be exercised for the benefit of those people. The only persons that are elected representatives of the interests of the people in the executive is the president and the deputy president. The other cabinet secretaries are just appointees of the president, Madam Speaker. And if this government, the Jubilee government, has the worst enemies, the worst enemies are to be found within the cabinet secretaries. Because they are giving the government a very bad name. A bad name that when they are called account to, to account for decisions made in their ministries, they don't want to turn up. But as speaker, I want to conclude by saying that my political party, WIPA, has gone into a working arrangement, a cooperation agreement with the Jubilee administration. The purpose of that agreement, Madam Speaker, is to push government agenda for the benefit of the people of Kenya in parliament and out of parliament. But anything else, Madam Speaker, that speaks contrary to development, that speaks contrary, Madam Speaker, to the rights of people, that speaks contrary, Madam Speaker, to the welfare of the people, our party is not part of that decision. We cannot be seen, Madam Speaker, uh, to be pushing forward an agenda that we strongly believe is not for the good of this nation. As I conclude, Madam Speaker, I want to say that the high cost of fuel and the high cost of electricity has made life almost unbearable for the people of Kitui. And I stand here, Madam Speaker, to deliver their message. And they have said, Madam Speaker, to the extent that they have a government that the party they support has said is in cooperation with, they want to see the price of fuel coming down. They want to see the price, the cost of electricity coming down, Madam Speaker. And that is a message that we deliver from Kitui loud and clear. Madam Speaker, I support. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Halaga Abshiro Soka. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to support the, uh, the censure motion that was brought by Senator Orengo. Um, and I'd like to associate myself with the, with the contents of the motion, Madam Speaker. As much as censure motions are not necessarily binding or a vote of no confidence, nonetheless, it gives us an opportunity to, uh, on behalf of, uh, of, of, of the people of this country to criticize or to censure and to, to, to point out some of the injustices and some of the lack of accountability by our, our two, uh, it's not just two, but actually most of our, our CSS have got that habit of standing the committee of Senate up on various, on various occasions. And Madam Speaker, Uh, that we must point out <laughs> what is out of order. But go ahead, go ahead. Madam Speaker, I know the standing order is like the back of my hands. I've been here for 10 years. And uh, I can point out, first of all, the point of order is, is beyond the standing order. It's actually the Constitution. Is it in order? Yeah. Contrary to Article 96, for my good friend, who I'd hate to interrupt, to say that a motion being discussed by the Senate is not binding. Are we discussing a suggestion 
Are we discussing, uh, you know, just to talk? This is not a talk shop. When I speak of motions of this house are binding and are taken seriously. It, okay. it, may not be an, it may not be an impeachment motion, but a motion in this house is actually a binding resolution. And that is why, after the motion, a vote is taken. A vote will be taken by members to say if they support the motion by Senator Orengo. And Senator Orengo is not idle to give us a motion that is just for, you know, a picnic. So, Madam Speaker, you need to rule okay. on whether this Thank motion you. is just child's play and just a suggestion or if it is binding, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I wish to, while I respect the fact that he's actually um, trying to, to say that it's binding, it's not. A sanction motion is not necessarily binding. Let's not lie to the citizens. But we have our every right as the, of this House to make sure that we follow up with these things. I don't know where, uh, and the reason why I'm putting that caveat is so that then we don't set ourselves up for expectations that we cannot fulfill. It's in, in a, but uh, uh, maybe would, Senator would, Orengo can, can guide like, us. Uh, yeah, no, I would like, uh, honorable, honorable members, I, I want, I want Senator, because we really want to wind up, I want Senator Abshiro to complete. Uh, the leader of minority, honorable members, Senator, no, Senator, Senator Orengo, Senator Orengo is going to respond. You shouldn't be made to rule. You rule according to how you, you feel fit. Back, back, back to Senator Sagaja. <laughs> Madam Speaker, this is a central motion. When you say it is all binding, it means that when you've passed it and you vote, that the Senate could have censured or not. Yes. If we pass a central motion, we have censured that cabinet secretary. And maybe the dictionary word or the Black Laws dictionary is what... Senator Abjur needs to be told what censure is. It is an expression of dissatisfaction and disappointment that is a binding expression. It may not mean that we are removing them from office because that is an impeachment motion. But I you cannot say that anything discussed in this house is not binding. That is a kind of disrespect of this house that we're talking about. We can't be the ones who are downplaying what we're doing. Why would we be sitting here till now? Uh, thank you. I, I, I think it's a misunderstanding of the word censure. I think uh, Sakaja has picked it right. It's the word censure. But by the way, when we pass the motion, we'll have censored. Yes, yeah. yeah. So unle unless you are saying something different, I've said when we pass the motion, it is censured. Yes, yes, you want to read on the provision? Yes, yes, what is point of information? Does she want your information? On the provision. Yes, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, um, Article 94 the role of parliament uh, into four five. There is no body or no person or body other than parliament has the power to make provision having the force of law in Kenya except under authority con conferred by this constitution and by legislation. Madam Speaker, when we stand here and say that this Senate can take two days of its deliberations and make a provision, pass a provision, whether a motion or a statement or a petition, and it has no basis in law, it is just a talk show. Madam Speaker, we are setting up this parliament, this Senate, for mass failure and disrespect in this country. Madam Speaker, I would just want to wish to ask my sister, my friend, Senator uh, Halake, uh, to, to maybe reframe that statement, because the impression created is what we are doing is we are just passing time, you know, we're not doing anything uh, important. Thank you, thank, you. thank you, Senator. I think uh, Senator Sakaja clarified it very well. It was a, ma a matter of semantics. When we come up with a censor motion, the end of it is that we have censored. If we say yes, if we say no, it, it drops. But um, so I want, I want Senator, I want to uh, request Senator Bishiro. To, to go into the, the material contribution that she had on this, because we really must, we, we must have the mover responding. Madam Speaker, the, the assertion has a bearing on the, on the content or the material of, 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 
of my of my debate and that is the reason why i am saying uh, you have another point of order from senator locorio petronila uh, thank you madam speaker i would just like the Say the minority leader, the mover, when he comes to reply, to probably explain to us what he means by censure in this context. And if we vote yes to censure, what does that mean? So that we avoid this confusion. Okay. Uh, Senator Bishira, please complete. Very much. Yeah. You know, as much as we wish to, to, to perhaps, you know, run away from some, some facts, Facts are very stubborn. And when I talked about maybe not binding, I didn't mean that we have no right to censure. I meant that perhaps the, the outcome we, this, we want as this house, namely, for instance, a punishment for, or, or some consequence for no, non-appearance of these CSS may not be realized because this is not a, a motion of no confidence and that that may be short of it, but can we criticize, can we broadly, um, you know, make sure that we, on behalf of our electorate and on behalf of the country, you know, talk, or criticize and, 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 and put to account? Of course, yes. But one of the things perhaps my debate was going to take us towards is to say, what are some of these outcomes that is going to form part of this censure motion? Maybe, yes, I'm a first-timer. I'm not going to pretend I have been here for 10 years. I haven't been. But what I am observing and I'm seeing and which I'm not going to retract from is the fact that what exactly is this going to, outcome is going to give us. It has given us the opportunity as this house to make sure we, we do what we do best, representation of our people and to hold accountable some of the um, arms of government that we work with. And that we're doing very well. But we cannot sit here and pretend that, they, that we are going to have certain um, outcomes or, or going, that this essential motion is going to give us what we are set out to do. For instance, bring these people here. It hasn't done that. But that having been said, I am, I am not here because to, 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 to belittle our house. I am part of it and I take responsibility for the entire, for the entire thing. I am, I, am in the, I am in the committee that actually has, even today, uh, made sure that we, 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 we summoned and we, we find, we'll do what we can. But censure motions are so that then we air our views, we let ourselves, uh, you know, we, we make sure that we are accounting, we're, we're holding the, the executive accountable. But with regards to consequences, maybe Senator Orengo is going to give us an advisory opinion, he's going to tell us what exactly is going to happen. But to my knowledge, I don't see us being able to use a censure motion to get the outcomes we want. And maybe I can be told that. But that having been said, the material of my, my, my presentation, Madam Speaker, as I stand up and support this censure motion, is that it's about time we looked at other innovative approaches as to how to work with the executive because we've been told, and everybody has said, these fuel price hikes, the taxation on renewable energy, for instance, which I also brought a, 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 a statement to this house, Madam Speaker, were gross injustices to the poor of this country. And the fact that they can't even come before us to tell us that this is the reason and this is what occasioned these things is, is, is actually blatant disregard for the rule of law, blatant disregard for a house of parliament. And I support the censure motion because it gives us the opportunity to make sure that our stance is known as this house and that we can look at other innovative ways of bringing our accountability to the next level and to, and to make sure that even as we censure them, what outcome are we going to? And this is where I was going with that, with that debate, to say that to what end? We have had our say for two days now, but Wanjiko is still in the same situation. The Boda Boda guy is still in the same situation. The people in northern Kenya who are taxed heavily for, for photovoltaic um, solar panels are still in the same situation. The electricity bills are out of hand. 
what are we going to do to achieve the outcomes we de that the people of Kenya deserve? And that is the reason why I spoke about, perhaps, some of the binding things that we do, because we're not just doing things for the sake of it. We're doing things so that we achieve results. And while I am cognizant of the fact that every effort that a member of parliament makes will eventually lead to awareness, at least, or will lead to certain actions that, that are going to happen, we must devise methods, and we must make sure that our, we are not just a talk shop, that we are going to put our money where our mouths are, that we are not going to speak. Madam Speaker, one of the things that perhaps, perhaps it's politics, perhaps it's not, is that it's, it's better to say a beautiful lie than to, to say the truth and lose votes. It's not on. Our electorate are smart enough to know that no matter how much we say we have the powers to do A, B, C, D, if we don't, we don't. It's better we even say we don't and that then we do what is in our pivot, what is in our, in, our, in our ability to do and to make sure that we start to change the game from just appearing good to actually doing good, I support. Uh, thank you, Senator. Finally... Senator Harkura Godana. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, I'd like to support this censure motion, which was brought by the minority leader, because, uh, first of all, the content of the motion is very clear. The issue of uh, rising fuel prices and uh, electricity prices are very real, and it has affected all Kenyans of all walks of life, and uh, the issue is in public domain. And as people's representative, this house uh, decided to call the two CSS to come and explain, because they are the ones who are in charge of these uh, dockets. And it's very clear that uh, the Speaker of the Senate has directed the committee to send an uh, invitation to the CSS. And it was very clear there are the two CSS, energy and uh, petroleum, because of the two aspects of the question, that is fuel prices and electricity prices. And it's very clear that they did not turn up and they did not give any reason, and that is why this censure motion is here. But uh, also looking at uh, now what is required of the Senate, we have to express uh, grave concern on the unprecedented increase in fuel and electricity costs, which, uh, of course, concern the two CSs. And if you look at what we wanted from them is an explanation of why this is the situation and why Kenyans are being taxed and exposed to this high cost of uh, energy, which is resulting in high cost of transportation, high food cost, high electricity, and uh, other adverse effect on other sectors of the economy. But if you, look at, if you look at the two issues, the fuel cost. Fuel cost is mainly because of the taxes, and if you look at the... And it's, uh, it's based on uh, a product of parliament... That is the energy. That is energy regulation of 2010, and I don't see why these CSS had any problems to come and address Parliament and say that the, the cause of these uh, fuel prices hiking is because of the regulation which the Parliament passed. I don't know what was difficult with them coming explaining that, but they did not come, and that is why they need to be censured. And it's very clear that it concerned the two of them. None of them sent a representative. One of them was even in, in the press saying that it doesn't, what was raised doesn't concern him, the, the CS for energy, while it's very clear electricity falls under him. Madam Speaker, if you look at the two issues, the issue of fuel prices, it's very clear that uh, the cause is the taxation, because if a country like Uganda, which exports its fuel through our port and transports it on our roads, still sells it cheaper, in, in Uganda than we are selling it here is because of the taxation. Because we'll find more than 50% of the cost of that fuel in Kenya is tax. Taxes which we don't even know, because if you look at them, there are seven tax, there are seven levies and two taxes which are added there. And uh, we don't even know what actually at the end of the day is used for these, uh, some of these taxes because like even the road maintenance levy fund, we remember sometimes this year we have been discussing it, funds which are taxed specifically for road maintenance have been 
used in case of the county is an equitable share. So it's not even going to road maintenance in some case. The 15% which goes to the county doesn't go to road maintenance. The issue of the petroleum regulatory levy, which has been said to be about 30 billion in the last uh, 10 months, is supposed to regulate uh, to cushion this, is not there, which means it's being diverted. So there are things which the CSS need to come and explain. And uh, if they don't come, then uh, we have no other option but to uh, censure them. The railway levy, the, the kerosene anti-adulteration, petroleum development, road maintenance, all these are on, 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 on the, uh, the litre of petrol we are buying, the fuel we are buying. buying. So there is need for the minister to come and explain this. And if they don't come, then we have no option but to censure them because it's very clear that the parliament has the authority to, to summon them and they have duty in law as per the constitution, which they swore to uphold that they are supposed to appear before parliament any time to answer to any question. If you look at the energy, the, the electricity aspect, sometimes I think uh, early this year or late last year, I can remember uh, Senator Wetangula asked a question to the CS Energy on the issue of these uh, prices of uh, electricity from the point of uh, the so-called cheap energy, the electric wind power farm. Uh, it was very clear that uh, the cost of energy which we have uh, experiencing now is because of mismanagement of uh, Kenya Power, which was a monopoly, which is a monopoly still, which has been making profit and declining until 2019, and the first, I think, loss, serious one could be this year, of, uh, last year of $7 billion in 2020, a loss, which uh, shows very clearly that uh, the, the, the institution is being mismanaged, there are very serious corruption scandals, interference of uh, running of the, of the corporation by uh, the, the boards. All these are very clear. The other issue is how they are balancing the different sources of power. We are being told that uh, they are supposed to move from thermal energy using diesel generators, which are expensive, to renewable. Geothermal has been improving, and geothermal is cheap. And uh, still there is hydro, which because of climate change may not be reliable, but uh, wind and solar, these ones are also being introduced. But there is no movement towards this cheaper energy. And even where it said it's, it's to be cheap, you look at the kind of power purchase agreements which are being signed with these people. They are so skewed that, uh, like in the case of Lectucana Wind Power, the case which Senator Otangula was following, we paid 15 billion shillings without that company supplying a unit of electricity. Single unit, 15 billion. And if the, if the CS come, I'll have asked him, because I have the written reply, which he said, Senator Otangula asked, are you going to pay more than the 6 billion you have paid so far? He said, no. But the country went ahead and paid 9 billion extra without being supplied any single unit of power. Then, continuously, the, the power, power purchase agreement says, take or pay. If, if the generating capacity of uh, electric power is 310 megawatts and they are doing 60 percent, maybe that's 20, 000, uh, 200 megawatts, even if they don't supply, even if you don't uptake the 200, you have to be paying the 200. It's, it's constant. You are paying between 12 billion to 15 billion to electric power each year, whether you are getting that power or not. While the bank, when Kenya approached for, finan for uh, financing that project, refused to, to guarantee that project refused. It said you don't have the capacity to absorb the 300 at once, do it in spaces of 100. The, can, the, the Kenya power or the Kenya government refused, went to uh, Africa Development Bank and some European banks, and now we are paying for power we are not consuming because most of the power is generated at night. That's when the wind is fast and we are not a uh, 24-hour economy. So we are wasting it that way. But we are paying for each and every unit of power which they are supposed to have. Shillings, while it would have costed half of that because of mismanagement and all that. Not doing due diligence, contractors go bankrupt and we are running into problems. Then uh, if you look at uh, the, the those uh, agreements end. So we are having a lot of uh, power we are paying for without being supplied and that's why the cost of power is not reducing. These are the things the minister should have addressed here and we'll have seen how to get the Kenyans out of this situation. 
But uh, what we are having a situation where the CS is not coming, is not uh, sending anybody, is like we are not there and we are not there to question him. And that is why we need to censure him. And if it, even if there is a stronger way of uh, expressing ourselves, we need to look at it. Uh, if censure will not be enough to make them wake up and do their work, then we have to look at what other means do you have in law so that these public officers need to, to work and need to be accountable. Madam Speaker, because of that, uh, some serious energy consumers in these countries have decided to generate their own power. Today I was reading that DEF is kill one of, steals one of the major consumers of power have decided to generate their own power from coal. Because the power from Kenya power is not reliable, it's very expensive, you have to make your own way. Kenyans want to go to uh, means like solar system, but they are taxed and it cannot be cheaper. If you look at the way power is being generated, northern Kenya, from Lodwa all the way to Wajia, Mandera, Marsabit, Garissa, you could easily generate uh, solar power and connect those towns because they're all off-grid. But now the country insists, the Kenya power insists on uh, diesel generators, which are expensive. People there are being exposed to expensive, dirty energy because somebody cannot allow them to. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senators. May I now ask the mover to reply? Uh, Madam Speaker, I wish to thank all uh, distinguished Senators who have uh, participated in this debate. And uh, I, ha I have to emphasize that uh, this motion has been a, a bipartisan motion in the sense that uh, it has received support from both sides of the House. And uh, I just wanted to demonstrate to part particularly Senator Abushiro the importance of a censure motion. Normally in parliamentary democracies, no a censor motion would never get to the floor of the House because the ruling party would never allow it to come to the floor because they know the consequence of a censor motion. They will never, never allow a censor motion against their own, uh, one of their own or one of their ministers to be given priority. So the impact of a censor motion is important in the sense that uh, parliament, parliaments and governments that operate in parliaments knows that uh, that stigma of having been uh, censored, be it a minister or be it a government, uh, is something that, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I've called it a stigma, but it's something that the electorate uh, would... Uh, take uh, very seriously. Uh, I was in Bahamas recently, and if you hear the discussion that was going on about the conduct of the government in power and what the ministers were doing, and some of them who had had motions like this uh, presented before the parliament in Bahamas, uh, you, would, uh, you, would have, you would predict uh, from the people of that country that the government was going to lose. Uh, that election, and indeed they lost thoroughly because of uh, motions like this. Now, you would notice that this uh, motion uh, was prioritized, which means it has the support of both sides. It was uh, uh, taken before uh, the leadership of the House and also before uh, the plenary of this House. In fact, it was in the middle of a, a debate uh, uh, in plenary that many members unanimously said they needed a substantive motion uh, to discuss uh, uh, this particular motion in respect of the conduct of the ministers or the cabinet secretaries or on expressing our concern on the escalating uh, rise uh, of fuel and electricity. Now, that is not even enough. In uh, parliamentary democracies, and it has happened here. Uh, a lot of people will not wait for that essential motion to hit the floor. The moment they, they hear that there's going to be a essential motion, uh, unless 
their side, if be the government or the opposition is going to offer resistance, then that particular person would re resign from that position. And I gave the example of the former vice president, uh, Josphat Karanja. It was a motion like this. It, 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 he was not obliged to resign. But just because the censure motion had been brought before parliament, he had no alternative but to resign from, from that position. Uh, nobody forced him, but it, he, made, he made a decision uh, to, to resign. Um, thirdly, Kimunya, it, it has been cited. There was a motion which was brought before parliament. And uh, as a result of that motion, although he was resisting resignation, you know, the government of the day said, no, 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 we can't have you with us until this matter is, is properly cleared uh, because of the decision that was made by the National Assembly uh, at, at that time. Now, the more imp importantly, in our constitutional order, we have set a basis for removal. Uh, because once you have been found, you have been found to be in contempt, uh, you, you have disobeyed the law. And under Article 153, um, a minister can be re removed for a constitutional violation, for a, viola a violation of, uh, of, of the law, and also uh, um, if there is belief that that particular person has committed a crime under international law. And we have seen many cases where impeachment motions have come before this House based on prior uh, events or processes, which had nothing to do with, uh, uh, with impeachment uh, as impeachment, uh, but that material, like being found uh, by the Auditor General uh, to have, uh, you know, um, abused the procurement process, then that is used as a basis for, for impeachment of a governor. So th this is a serious matter, and... You know, in uh, uh, administration, uh, those who have uh, gone through administrative law, and even within our uh, statutes, uh, you would find uh, categories of punishment or sanctions, uh, and even admonition, a warning. <laughs> that is punishment. Uh, but essentia is even more serious, and particularly when it comes from, from the Senate. Now, uh, Madam Speaker, there are Many things that have been said before this house, and I don't want to repeat. And I want to, I really appreciate the material that was placed before this uh, Senate in regard to uh, the uh, pump prices of oil and also the cost of electricity. And um, they have been mentioned here. And for example, in relation to uh, to importations of oil, there are several taxes and levies which are normally imposed on any uh, uh, importation of oil, and they include the excess duty, the merchant shipping levy, the import declaration fee, the road maintenance levy, which a lot of people have talked about, the anti-adulteration levy, the petroleum development levy, the Petroleum Regulation Levy, the Railway Development Levy, the Value Added Tax. So in effect, if you put these things in totality, <laughs> petrol stations actually now become uh, as tax, tax collection centers, really, in essence. Uh, because, you know, uh, according, to <laughs> uh, according to EPRA itself, you know, the cost of uh, petrol, uh, I mean, cost, uh, the, the, the landed cost of, of petrol, super or diesel or kerosene, is about half the, 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 what you pay for it at the petrol station. And uh, in effect, then, petrol stations are very important uh, as tax <laughs> collection stations. Now, um, and the same goes to electricity, you know, the uh, fuel. Uh, cost uh, uh, charge, the inflation adjustment, forex adjustment, there's an EPR levy, there's VAT, there's water resource management authority levy, and there's even a levy for 
rural electric, uh, you know, electrification program. And all these costs put together, they uh, put Kenyans in a category where we are paying more than we need to pay you know, for, for electricity. And I, I wanted as really, Madam Speaker, to look at this thing in a really non-political way because, you know, the farmer in Moranga, and I'm seeing the senator from Moranga here, and the farmer in Siaya, they're in exactly the same position. Despite our politics, they are exactly in the same position. A man from Ukambani who is staying in Kibra, or a man from the coast who is staying in Madare, you know what the impact of these costs are exactly the same, and there is no way they can, uh, you know, run away from those uh, runaway costs as we have been discussing here. Now, and the other day I was looking at the example of simple, simple little things which you may take for granted. Um, normally, over a period uh, of the last eight months, the cost of three tomatoes was about 10 shillings. Now, one tomato, if you go to, to Madari or, or Kibra, one tomato will cost you now about 10 shillings. And for somebody who is earning, let's say, like I said yesterday, 15,000 shillings, and you find what that household needs and the costs that have been uh, placed uh, arising out of this electricity cost and fuel, you'd find that you know, their, their situation uh, is completely uh, unbearable. And the, uh, the, the parliament must in future be very conscious uh, when we pass legislation on matters to do with this uh, uh, power and, uh, and, and fuel, because there are costs that cut across uh, production and cut across uh, you know, um, uh, co uh, you know, consumption. They cut across uh, supplies and, and distribution. Uh, and therefore, it is important that we, we are very careful uh, we don't overburden our, our citizens. And Madam Speaker, I would want one day in this country that as we think of how to manage public affairs, that it is issues like this that should be under discussion. It should be under discussion how we are dealing with this issue. You know, right now in, the, in Congress in the United States of America, within the Democratic Party itself, uh, they, they have uh, arguments going on about the infrastructure, you know, program that, you know, uh, uh, President Biden wants to uh, pull through as one of his legacy programs. Uh, and people are having various, um, you know, inputs uh, in, in that debate. So that in Kenya also, we, we should uh, try as much as possible. Because at the end of the day, what, what is governance for? if it is not to make people's life better and the cost of living cheaper for our people. At the end of the day, you know, we, we, we should uh, be happy uh, when we pass legislation that uh, a Kenyan can stand up and say we truly be, uh, live in a caring uh, society. But unfortunately, uh, all these matters are sometimes lost in translation uh, because, like now, we are looking towards 2022. Uh, but if you allow these kind of things to happen, whoever is going to take over government in 2022, I, I don't think you will be having a, a good night's sleep. You will not, because this has got an impact on debt, and debt also has an impact on this rising cost. Because really, why would the government need to, you know, uh, make Kenyans pay? to us as much as they should pay uh, for, let's say, a gallon of petrol. Uh, it is really because we are living either beyond our means or we have overborrowed or corruption has become a way of life that uh, we have to budget for it. And uh, instead of making people's lives better, we, we are trying to uh, uh, give subsidy uh, to corruption and give subsidy to waste and give subsidy uh, to uh, bad governance. 
So, uh, Madam Speaker, I don't want to take any longer on this matter because I think there's been a, a very robust debate. And I want to thank the second uh, Senator Moses Wetangula because I gave him very short notice and he was able to do justice uh, to this motion. And uh, I could even take my time in congratulating every single member. I think I will take a record of the deliberations of this House on this matter. And if I have a space in my, in, in my uh, autobiography, uh, some of these discussions in this debate will go down, at least on my part, uh, as a day and a debate that I was very proud of uh, in, the, in the manner in which every senator uh, approached the, this matter. Now, I w just want to conclude because, you know, some people have said, you know, this is because of the handshake. No, 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 it cannot be because of the handshake. Uh, and I think that is trying to politicize a purely uh, uh, economic and a uh, governance issue. Uh, and I don't want to stand here and say, you know, uh, th this motion was brought for any political purposes. This motion was just brought to speak for the common man, to f speak for the Kenyan people. And as you say that Orengo brought this motion, I did not bring this motion. W when we were meeting here as a committee of the whole house, uh, it was because of those discussions that came in the committee of the whole house. And the committee said that this matter must be, be raise, raised in the afternoon in the plenary. And it is the house in plenary who, uh, uh, which decided. And in fact, we went for an adjournment that a substantive motion should be brought uh, to discuss this matter. And therefore, it is not my motion. I was uh, simply um, carrying out the directions of the house. And uh, uh, our sat here, nobody has opposed this motion. Uh, and if they have not voted, if they're not going to vote, a uh, voice vote is a motion whether you, you wanted to vote by your feet, it, that will not count. <laughs> so in essence, you know, the vote for this, in my view, has been unanimous, even for those who are not here uh, because of the other duties they're performing. I uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the House. I move. Uh, thank you, Senator. Honorable Senators, I would like to confirm that this is not a matter affecting counties in accordance with uh, uh, Article 123.4 of the Constitution, so there will be a voice vote. I now put a question that I'm aware that on the 15th September 2021, a statement was requested under Standing Order 48.1 regarding the recent increase of fuel uh, prices by the Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority, EPRA, and whereas the Speaker of the Senate directed the Standing Committee on Energy to invite the Cabinet Secretaries of the Ministries of Petroleum and Mining and Energy to appear before the Committee on Tuesday, 21st September 2021, to appraise the Committee and the entire Senate on the unprecedented escalation of fuel prices in the country. And whereas the Standing Committee on Energy invited the two uh, cabinet secretaries, pass one to Article 153, 3, and 4 of the Constitution, to appear before the committee on Tuesday, 21st September 2021, at 11 a.m., noting that the said cabinet secretaries failed to appear to honor the invitation to attend the meeting of the committee, cognizant of the fact that the sharp increase in fuel prices in the country has had a ripple adverse effect on the economy, leading to a rise in the cost of living and the cost of doing business on an already of a burdened citizenry grappling with the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, further aware that this increase in fuel prices has outraged a majority of Kenyans who, are, who, who bear the blunt of the effects 
of the increase, such as high cost of transportation, high food prices, high cost of electricity, among other adverse effects on most sectors of the economy. Now, therefore, the Senate, one, expresses its grave concern on the unprecedented increase in fuel and electricity costs and the adverse effects that these have had on the economy and, and the livelihoods of the people of Kenya, and two, expresses its dissatisfaction with the conduct of the two cabinet secretaries, namely Honorable John K. Munez, Cabinet Secretary for Petroleum and Mining, and Honorable Charles Keter, Cabinet Secretary for Energy, in failing to appear before the Senate to address these urgent issues, thereby abdicating their responsibilities as set out in Article 153, 3, and 4 of the Constitution. Will as many as of that opinion say aye? aye. Will as many as of the contrary say nay? The ayes have it. Next order. Order number nine, the Disaster Risk Management Bill, Senate Bills number 14 of 2021, second reading. The senator who was on the floor was Senator Petronila, 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 Were Locorio. 17 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise uh, to support the Disaster Risk Management Bill that is ably again um, sponsored by the champions of change, that is Senator Sakaja Johnson, Super Senator, and, Sakaja, and uh, Senator Mutula Kilonzo Jr. Mr. Speaker, as I had indicated earlier on, I will uh, go through the introduction again, Mr. S Madam Speaker. No, Mr. Speaker, sorry. Uh, welcome, Senator Speaker Kinywa. Um, Mr. Speaker, this disaster, disaster risk uh, management bill seeks to do a number of, of things. I will point out three that are uh, crucial to me. Um, Mr. Speaker, first of all, this bill seeks to set up a disaster risk management fund. This is important, Mr. Speaker, because then we are sure that there's always a kitty to deal with issues of disaster. Mr. Speaker, for example, when COVID hit us, we had to set up quickly a national uh, COVID fund to fundraise money to deal with the effects of uh, COVID. But if there was money already in place, then we'd be able to handle disasters that strike us things like not just pandemics or diseases, but things like uh, floods, uh, bomb blasts when they hit us, um, earthquakes, landslides that are very common in the Rift Valley and the Mount Kenya area, for example. There will be a fund set up ready, and money is always put into it to deal with these issues. This money can also be used to provide social safety uh, networks or initiatives to cushion SMEs, for example, or the vulnerable groups of society. So this is the one attractive thing about the, this, this disaster risk uh, management uh, bill. Mr. Speaker, this bill therefore uh, sets up a framework for the coordination of disaster, uh, disaster risk management activities. The second thing that it does is that it sets up the National Disaster Risk Management Authority that is at the national level. And because we have the reality of devolution that is never going away, it has also set up the County Disaster Risk Management Authority. Mr. Speaker, these authorities will be run by boards and therefore they are, they are accountable. Most importantly, that uh, they, they, will, they will be the ones that will uh, uh, seek to set up uh, or develop a disaster risk management strategy or plan 
so that when there is a problem, a mis uh, Mr. Speaker or a disaster, there is a plan or strategy in place ready to implement or to deal with that disaster so that people are not grappling in the dark or that it is not just left to the military. For example, Mr. Speaker, when there was a bomb blast in 1998 and most of the people here were born, it's the military that saved the day because from their training, they have, they have developed strategies to deal with disasters. I remember the letter, God rest his soul in peace, who passed on, I think, last month, led the disaster, uh, the management of that disaster of 1998. So that once we have an authority in place that sets up a strategy and plan that, is already, that already envisages a disaster and how it will be dealt with, then, Mr. Speaker, we are, we are able to manage some of these issues when they happen. Even, even uh, the ones that come occasionally, like lands, landslides, um, like even what happened in, in Solai when the dam collapsed and the uh, floods that happen frequently in areas in Nyanza and, uh, and Western. Mr. Speaker, this... Um, Disaster Risk Management Authority at both the national level and the county level will also create public awareness campaigns, some form of drills, for example, so that members are always aware that in case something like a landslide happens in your area, what is the expected reaction so that people don't respond with panic and therefore create more, more deaths or more injuries and therefore make the disaster even um, the impact of the disaster higher than it should have been. Mr. Speaker, these, the authorities will also create linkages with the various, with the various uh, ministries, departments and agencies, community service um, organizations. Create, uh, look for ways also of identifying a hazard before it occurs. So they can, for example, have um, a team or experts that can tell that uh, the central province, for example, is prone to, to landslides. I'm using landslides more because uh, the rains are coming, the short rains are coming, and that is one disaster that we expect to have, landslides and floods. They will be able to tell that the, the landslide or the flood will happen in such a place at a particular time and in such a manner, and alert the people in, in time. So, um, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I support uh, this bill and uh, this uh, disaster risk management authority, a form of uh, a form of a parastatal, is going to to organize and deal with disasters in this country in a more organized manner. Right now, what we have is a disaster management unit that is run under the office of the president, or what was formerly the provincial administration. They lack funds, they lack a budget that is specifically dedicated to them. They are considered um, an emergency. So if the emergency doesn't happen, then that money is not spent. So even the little money that they are given will be taken away in case there are other burning issues. But once it is an authority, uh, Mr. Speaker, and not just a unit within a, a, or a, a department within some government office, then we will be able to deal with disasters in a, a better and organized manner in this country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Senator Werer Okorio. Senator Irongo Kangata from Moranga. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, allow me to congratulate the drafters and the movers of this bill. Uh, reason being that uh, Kenya has had uh, several disasters, and therefore it was important that we come up with a bill that tries to collate various measures that are used by government to remedy those uh, disasters. Mr. Speaker, that those disasters include uh, floods, they include uh, terrorism-related uh, occurrences, which can cause uh, some form of disasters. They also include uh, hunger. We all know there's a huge region in this Republic of Kenya that is very exposed to disasters which arise out of various natural phenomena. And therefore, to that extent, I think we need to loud the spirit that underlines this bill. However, allow me to express my reservations 
which I have no doubt the good drafters will definitely consider taking into account. Mr. Speaker, this Republic of Kenya has about 350-something parastatos, that is state bodies. And every time Kenyans see a new parastato being created, their blood must run cold, Mr. Speaker. Reason being, we all know state bodies, parastatos, they are avenues for people to enter into those offices. They get allowances. They push governments for more and more opportunities through which they can conduct corruption. And therefore, to the extent that uh, this bill is proposing to create a standalone state entity, I am a little bit reluctant to support uh, such kind of a pivot. Mr. Speaker, is the, yes, I, I, I do you want, want to be uh, Senator yes. Kangata, do you want to be informed? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to um, humbly inform my esteemed colleague from Muranga that uh, this bill does not seek to create a new agency. What it does, if you go through it, is that it brings together the many different small units that have been dealing with disaster because there has been lack of coordination. So you have the NDOC that currently exists, you have the NDMU that currently exists, and there's a department under special programs ministry that normally comes in to give food and whatnot. So we're bringing them together under one. In fact, there, may be a, there will be a lot of cost savings. So we're not creating a new entity per se. And in fact, if you look at the transitional provisions, Senator Kangata, it provides for how the staff who are currently employed in those three entities will transition to this amalgamated um, agency. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senator Kangata. Uh, th th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I'm very happy with that uh, intervention from one of the drafters of this bill. Uh, if, if, yes, I think there are two. But the point is, if I get his intervention and information right, he's saying that uh, this bill is creating a body to take over functions to bring together. Now, uh, maybe, maybe the clarification that I may require is to know those other entities which are currently existing, are they established by a statute? Are they departments within a ministry? I say so because when you look at um, proposed Article 3 or Section 3 of this bill, it clearly provides that uh, establishment of the National Disaster Risk Management Authority. So for me, I get the impression once I read this, we are creating an authority with all the, the powers, just like the way we have uh, in the road sector, we have Kera, we have in the road sector, we have Kura, we have in the road sector, Kenha, such kind of entities, yeah? And... Uh, in actual sense, it's a form of upgrading of the existing departments that deal with disasters. That is good. I would agree that is good. Maybe to that extent it is correct. But the advantages I would imagine that exist currently when you have what we call downgraded entities is that uh, they are not fully fledged parastatos. And therefore, there will not be a director de general uh, currently, we don't have a director general. Currently, we don't have, uh, let's say, a board. For me, maybe for me, from where I sit, and, and, and allow me to disclose my political persuasion, I belong to the, to the political theory of small government. The idea that the government should remain small and efficient. And every time we create a parastato, we create a fully-fledged state body, I am not so sure that is when we are increasing the efficiency. I get the impression it is when you are creating more opportunities for big boys to get jobs, for Kenyans to be taxed more. Uh, I, I get that impression. Uh, uh, maybe I will be persuaded uh, definitely once I hear the response from uh, the promoters of this bill.
and, 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 and I say this with a lot of respect, not only for this bill, but out of the so many bills I have seen, particularly even in the National Assembly, that every time I, uh, there's a proposal, to a legislative proposal, in it there is embedded the idea of forming a board. Yeah? Mr. Speaker, I'll give you an example of, uh, like currently we have a standalone board that deals with female genital mutilation. Without due respect, surely. Yeah? Uh, I don't want to go that stand, but I'm just trying to imagine a standalone board that deals with FGM. Okay, fine. Another standalone body that deals with, let me give you another example, Mr. Speaker. Human rights. Human rights, we have an overall body called Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, a government body that deals with human rights. Then we have another separate entity that deals with women's rights. Again, I think it's also government funded. I thought women's rights are human rights. Okay? Again, you have another entity that deals with children matters. I thought children's rights are human rights. Is it possible if we want a lean, efficient government, maybe can't we consider in Kenyans to collate, to amalgamate all those entities so that we have fewer people we are paying with tax money? Mr. Speaker, let me give you another example. Uh, look at the tourism sector, Mr. Speaker. How many entities do we have yeah, in tourism sector? We have the touring, I don't know, tourism fund what? Another entity. All of them bodies, boards that are dealing with a singular sector called tourism. What is it, uh, Senator Jackson Sakaja? Mr. Speaker, and I sincerely hope Senator Kamiata is not opposing for the sake of it. And this is the last time I'll interrupt him. But is it in order for him to mislead the House and actually contradict himself? He has given us an example of human rights where there are many bodies, and he said on the record that we should amalgamate them. He's talking about tourism where there are many bodies, we should amalgamate them. And what this bill is doing is bringing together three different bodies. NDOC, the National Disaster Operation Center, was established by an act of parliament in 1998 after El Nino. It's established by statute. There's a National Disaster Management Unit as well. There is now a special programs department where you have to call people to ask them for food and mabati when there's a disaster. We're bringing them together. So his, his, going, his own argument <laughs> against bringing them together is what he's using to propose that the human rights entities should be brought together, tourism entities be brought together. That is exactly what we are doing. So I'd, I'd just urge him, maybe he should have spent some more time with the bill to, to understand it, but not to oppose for the sake of it. Because what he's pushing for is exactly what this bill is actually doing, Mr. Speaker, for the benefit of the people of Kenya. And in fact, it will be cheaper. Because the costs, the, you know, what you call them, um, how do you call them when, when you, the benefits of scale, economies of scale, when one entity is doing one thing instead of three entities going against different, you know, going against each other doing the same thing, there's a lot of wastage there. So that is what we're trying to do. And that's the last time I'll interrupt him. I'll give more details when I reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I, can I continue? Information. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Senator Ring. Um, Mr. Speaker, the way Senator Kanata came in here, I knew he was coming for this bill. And when he comes from a bill, he has made up his mind in many ways. Uh, but I just wanted to inform him that one of the good things about this bill you know, the way we deal with disaster in this country is very disorganized. And this is creating a framework, not only bringing people together, but how to, to react to disaster. And you know, one of the things that happened when there was that Katrina thing in the United States, there was a big problem. You got many competent authorities, but when they come together, there was confusion. So I, I, I just want to urge you that uh, this little time we're taking away from you, look, look at it a little bit uh, better, because I, I, I'd wish that you support. Uh, first is to thank uh, my colleague. Uh, I, I take this opportunity to thank uh, Senior Council Orengo for that intervention, and also 
Honorable Sakaja. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I think I now see where the problem lies. And, and, and I want to concede, Mr. Sakaja, I think the problem lies in the drafting. Why do I say so? Because if there is an existing authority that is created by an act of parliament, then somewhere in the bill you needed to clearly and in express terms provide that you are repealing certain articles. You are repealing. You see, I have looked at this bill. The mention of National Disaster Operations Center, the National Disaster Management Unit, and the Department of Special Programs, the three entities, they are not in the substantive law, to the best of my knowledge, unless I have missed something, and I stand to be corrected. They are in the memorandum of objects and reasons. Oh, maybe, yeah, yeah, because maybe what we needed to do You see, you see, you see, section 39 talks of uh, bringing stuff together. You get the point? But the question is, this stuff, where they are coming from, are they coming from, from a body that is established in express manner by a statute? Do they have a board? Yeah? Because if they have a board, if they are clearly provided so in an act of parliament, you need to, in, to insert a clause here saying we are repealing X, Y Act of Parliament by passage of this. Otherwise, you'll have a situation where uh, you have Board X that is still there with its own disaster management thing. You have Board Y that is now created by this body. Uh, the staff have gone legally, but the board, because often the law will provide the board is a perpetual succession entity, will still exist independent of this other one. You get the point? Particularly taking into account what my colleague has said, that uh, these other bodies, they are created by statute. Yeah, I don't know. I, I heard him say that. If they are created by statute, maybe... What is it, Senator Sakaja? Mr. Speaker, I think now... Uh, anyway, Senator Kangata is, is an advocate. I am not one. But I know what we call the doctrine of implied repeal. And the doctrine of implied repeal, which takes precedence in many of the laws that we've done in this country, including in this parliament, is simple that, you know, an act of parliament um, or another legislature that conflicts with one which is new, the new one takes precedence, and that is only relating to NDOC. That is the doctrine of implied repeal. You don't have to necessarily put a clause saying that this, therefore, now, uh, repeals the NDOC Act that was there. But even then, it will cost us nothing to add it. But I just want Senator Kangata to, 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 to speak to that doctrine, which we have used in many legislations. In fact, if we didn't do that, then it means we need to actually change a lot of the acts that we've passed um, in, 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 in Parliament. The later act takes precedence once it has been passed. And I'm sure uh, Senior Counsel Lorengo knows that, Honorable Chiradgari knows that, uh, Professor uh, knows that the doctrine of implied repeal is very present in Kenya, uh, our, our, our legal jurisprudence, Mr. Speaker. And it's very, uh, I would, you know, I can't contradict his ahead of me in terms of law, but I'm also a very good law student, and I know S that doctor. Senator Sakaja, are you, are, you, are you trying to question the, the speaker doesn't know that? <laughs> okay. Senator Kangata. Okay, anyway, I, I think uh, the point I was just trying to bring into focus is that uh, we, 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 the, the drafters, they, they just take into account that uh, the idea of creating several parastatos, I think that's the, the point I was just trying to bring across. Uh, to the extent, if at all, there are two ways to look at it. Eh? Assuming what my colleague is saying is the correct position, Yes, we can in express terms provide that we are repealing a certain act so that you don't put any ambiguity. That would be number one possible remedy to this problem I'm talking about. The other option would be you go into that original act of parliament, you increase various roles. If you think the, the, the roles are not sufficient, 
Maybe that would be another point. But my point was only that uh, I hold the view that uh, we need to reconsider as a country the whole idea of creating several parastatos. I think personally I've had that issue. I say so with all due respect, not, not only for him. My experience as a member of Public Accounts Committee, Public Accounts and Investments Committee in the National Assembly, PIC, I used to notice uh, there's so many negative reports. We used to, they used to be tabled before the House, uh, not before the committee. I got the impression that uh, the fewer the state bodies that exist in this republic, the better it is for this country. Because the more resources will go into capital ex expenditure, the more resources uh, will not go into paying allowances for board members, and the more, I would imagine, the country would progress forward when you have fewer and fewer parastatos. To me, that was the only issue. But I support the gist of the, the gist, the spirit of this law, the idea of uh, to amalgamate, to bring everything together under one roof, that makes sense. As long as we, we, we are not adding bureaucracies, I think for me I will definitely support this bill if, if my, my colleague was to take uh, those uh, views into consideration. I, I beg to support, but with those uh, few uh, ideas. Thank you, Senator Kangata. Senator James Orengo. I, I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And first, congratulations for sitting on that chair. I should be t speaking in Swahili. You are one of the people who demonstrate that uh, a language, you don't need to be born uh, as part of that community. You can speak the language uh, so, so effectively. When you speak Swahili, I don't want to hear what you say or understand what you say. Just the way you speak it, I feel so good about it. Um, but let me congratulate Senator Sakaja for bringing this bill and Senator Mutula Kilonzo. And if you look at what is happening in the world now, this bill is so critical because disaster now in the world is an everyday event. Uh, look like a power like the United States of America. How to deal with the dis disaster even with the laws they have, they have got to keep on revising how they, they deal with this disaster. I know disaster, there are many forms. They are man-made. The worst of it can be terrorism. When a building is brought down in Nairobi, and that has been done before at the Westgate, how do you deal with that disaster? And of course, what happened in Garissa. And the most of the disasters that are being experienced in the world is natural disasters. And they're saying, just as we take lightly the question of climate change, climate change now in many parts of the world is a source of many problems. Volcanoes that used to be dormant are now erupting. And you know the, uh, where we live in, you know, the Great Rift Valley uh, has two, two, it is in two formations in, in this country. Uh, the Great Lakes of this country are in the Rift Valley. We have uh, craters like Longonot. And at the end of the day, we have to make sure that the question of disaster is not something that is left to security agencies or um, uh, you know, the NGOs or, or the Red Cross to deal with the questions of disaster. We must be sure that when a disaster happens, what happens? Like what I expect from what Senator Sakaja has done, because there is a provision for regulations to be made, is that we should have pro uh, regulations that set out a protocol that when there's a disaster, what do first responders do? If, for example, there is a uh, uh, a disaster in every part of Nairobi, and the police are there, the fire brigade is there, uh, the Red Cross is there, the army is there. How is that disaster going to be dealt with? Uh, and who would be in control in, in terms of dealing with that disaster? And now that we have devolution, 
And as uh, Hudson as Sakaja say, rightly point out that this is a shared responsibility between the national government and the county governments. What happens when that disaster takes place? Now, in Homer Bay, and uh, Senator Kajuang talked about it, there's a, a major disaster that has happened. Uh, people have died in the lake. Uh, the bodies are still being, you know, uh, recovered in, in the lake. Rescue operations are, are going on. But at the end of the day, you know, there's an appeal to political leaders. Uh, can you contribute? Uh, we don't know how to take these people to hospitals, where they would go, where is the appropriate place to take them. You know, how do, they, how do you operate that rescue operation? And in the lake now, actually, the, we are very, very uh, small in terms of having equipment and tools, and even men and women properly trained on how to deal with disaster in the lake. And uh, this is not the first one. There have been many. And you find local people with uh, small boats trying to rescue their own. And uh, the uh, government agencies come like two or three days later, or when they come, most of them come, they, they, come, uh, they come as observers. So this, in all reality, is, is, is the kind of legislation uh, and the kind of bill that when it's brought before the Senate, w we should think about improving it rather than opposing it, because I think it has come at the right time. I know um, as somebody who went, although... Uh, not as a first responder, but a very peripheral person. Uh, when the uh, disaster happened at Westgate, um, and you could see the confusion that uh, was taking place there, uh, and even within the security agencies, they would not, they would not even determine, is it the army that should be in control? Should it be the police? Uh, should it be the GSU? You know, all that confusion. Even how to deal with the media. Uh, how do you deal with the media? And uh, some horrific, horrific pictures went out I into the world media about, you know, what had happened at, uh, at the Westgate. So there is an architectural, uh, uh, you know, structure that comes out in this bill uh, that I, 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 I like. Uh, first of all, recognition of all the players government agencies and parastatals. If you look at that bill properly, it uh, gives entry points uh, to all those players, uh, both at the national level and then at the county level. And the county also, you know, how, how then do you uh, organize and create structures within the uh, county to deal with the question of, uh, of, of disasters? And just a minute ago, I thought that was like a preamble to a debate which started uh, some time ago when Senator Kajong was speaking. It was uh, like a preamble. In fact, I thought he would stay and uh, contribute to this bill, but knowing that, you know, we are likely to continue, I hope he can bring to this uh, chamber uh, next week real-life experiences as, as to what is happening in Homer Bay. And the worst thing that happens is when there's a disaster and you feel helpless and the government authorities also uh, feel helpless and the people also feel helpless. And, um, uh, you know, <laughs> Senator Sakaja, I was thinking that even in terms of this bill, if people are talking about disaster management, even Nairobi is very well uh, unplanned <laughs> for disaster. And somebody told me one time that, you know, there are some areas, some high-density uh, population areas in Nairobi, that if there is disaster, how to get fast responders? You, you want to get fire machines there, and the roads are <laughs> narrow. Uh, you want to bring other equipment into the, that place. So that this bill is going to change our thinking that if you want to live in safe ne neighborhoods and where you know, we can respond to disaster like is being proposed in this bill, 
how do we plan our cities uh, and our buildings to ensure that we can be able to effectively deal with the issues concerning disaster and the management of, of it. I don't know how many minutes I have left, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, Mr. Speaker, I will bring with me the copy of the bill. I've made some notes uh, because I think there's been a lot of thinking. Uh, and uh, that is one of the things you can trust uh, Senator Mutola Kilonzo and Senator Sakaja that once they come up with anything of this nature, there's been some thinking about it. The Senate Minority Leader, you have a balance of 51 minutes. Uh, Honorable Senators, it is now 6.30, time to adjourn the House. The Senate therefore stands adjourned until Tuesday, 28th September, 2021 at 2.30 p.m.